and I have been told that we are live. Hello, chat. How are you guys doing today? Welcome to a special edition of the Stormkeep Breaking News. Storm News. There we are. Okay. So we are just doing a bit of a pre-stream here. Killing some time. Yeah. Morgonk's running a little bit late. We had to set all this up last minute. Gonna get uh, the word out on Discord, make sure everybody knows that the stream has started. Hey, Bodnar, how, how you doing, doing, bud? Hey, Morgonk's here. Look at that. All right, boys. <laughs> Speak of the devil and he shall appear. We are live right now, buddy. Hey, guys. All right, then. How you doing, man? Would you uh, how'd you spend the whole day without talking about the FAQ? I'm, I'm, I'm oh man, um, I'm actually yeah away for uh, like spending Christmas with the families, so uh, I was traveling actually, but I still I was like I told my partner yeah this takeover driving I have to talk about the FAQ. <laughs> <laughs> it's big, so yeah, it is uh it's pretty big. Not as big as I thought it was going to be. I guess that's the first thing we can talk about here is that uh, when they first previewed this whole every three months we're going to do an update thing, I thought it was going to be more significant changes than this, like a GHB every three months almost. Maybe something like less than that. But this is really minor. This, these are not earth-shattering changes by any means. Yeah, I agree. Um, I mean... I guess because they want to do these kind of updates more often, um, they're trying to go for more conservative changes. Like, like we often discussed how nerfing, let's say, a bunch of hammer units, but then not doing anything to guards would, you know, leave the meta in a weird place. I guess they're like, well, let's not do either of those. Let's just like take these things incrementally one at a time and see what's up. Yeah, I, I gotta say, I favor them doing small incremental changes over time. And, and kind of just getting percentage points up and down a little bit rather than just a massive overhaul every three months. Because that's what I was most worried about was people would have their lists invalidated. They would have a whole bunch of purchases invalidated. Uh, it would create this this pall of, of unease about what to purchase. Like I didn't I didn't want to make any lists for a few months there, you know, well, not a few months, but like six weeks or so since they announced it. It was rough. Oh, yeah, completely. Um, and, you know, it's like you don't absolutely want to invalidate someone's armies, like bring something from potentially 60% to 40%. Maybe, you know, maybe see adjusting if adjusting it brings it down like five percentage points and maybe that's good enough. Um, I'm really glad. I mean, we're going to discuss it further, but I am like glad about the changes. There are There is more they could have done, but I'd rather just see that in three months from now. And I'm okay with that. I'm okay with seeing what how the meta shakes up. Yeah. Let's see what the chat's saying here. Hey, Neko, how you doing, buddy? Noah, how are you? Chase, you're back again after our, la our last live stream. There's a lot of names in here, I'm sure. I would recognize if you guys posted in the Discord what your name is on YouTube, because sometimes it doesn't doesn't match up one-to-one. -one. Like, I know Daniel yeah. Gomez is a guy we know from our Discord, but I just don't remember who that is. <laughs> I'm sorry, man. Yeah, Dante, uh, fire, fire Strike stonks are way up. Aventus Firestrike looks really solid in a lot of lists now. And all it took was not what, nerfing what, Fulminators. Did he drop by 20? 15. What did he, what happened to him? 15? Okay. It's not a lot, but yeah, not... given just how bad artifacts are now for us, because the Amulet of Destiny was nerfed, uh, Firestrike yeah. just, you just don't care about losing an artifact. So he's what, uh, 20 points over the generic one now? Or 30 points over the generic one? 25, I believe. I want to see 25 okay. yeah 285 to okay that's mm. it's a lot more reasonable than 40 i guess it is and it makes uh, the fact that he has a d3 heroic recovery built in considering the change to heroic recovery mm -hmm. actually makes him pretty good because you can't for recover sure. in combat but aventus can't because it's on his worst book yeah for sure i'm gonna test something i didn't try this last time when we were talking to coach but i want to see what the timing is because i set up alerts and they were on a delay on our first live stream so i'm just gonna test this yeah, right yeah. now I think that worked. 
I'm pretty sure that worked. <laughs> Tell us in the chat if it was like really close to when I pressed the button, when I was talking about. Um, okay, so um, the the big December FAQ update is here, and it's pretty exciting because spoiler stormcast just dodged every bullet like champions <laughs> like we're over here like oh, freaking yeah. neo in the matrix <laughs> you know like just everything's just flying past us it's it's just feels amazing i'm so used to just getting nerfed after the last oh god it's been like half a year of stormcast nerf after nerf after nerf but finally we we get something yeah. good here oh yeah and <laughs> it, it's so weird that a lot of what the good that was done to us is either A, not doing anything, or B, just changing core rules. Yeah. <laughs> like, slight core rule shift and our tone just become, because our book, I guess because that's a symptom of our book being so straightforward. Um, yeah, we, we live and die by the points and, and the core rules. That's all we have. We have almost yeah. nothing else to go off of. Yeah. So it's really, it's like, oh, wow, amulet change? Oh, great. All those, like, 18, 20 wound monsters and 35 wound monsters that couldn't we couldn't kill reliably even with Thunderbolt Volley because of the amulet. Well, now they're suddenly they're looking yeah. a lot more. You know, they've suddenly walked into Long Strike Raptor range. Oh yeah, there's so. any any monster with like 12 plus wounds that was just defaulting to an amulet of destiny. They are so much weaker now. A lot of them aren't even going to take the new amulet. I don't think it's worth an enhancement slot yeah. for most armies. Nope. Like my biggest thing was the Maw Crusher because uh, uh, even at, uh, at the Austin Open, I just struggled to really kill it uh, past that five up. Yeah, you the know, five up is so wallies on it. it's so much better than a six up. You go from twenty percent effective health to fifty percent. It's so nuts. It's not linear scaling. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, exactly. And like, it's, and especially like you know because we talk about in our Discord, we talk about the storm drake breath a lot. If you start spiking those fives, suddenly you know your opponent's like main hammer units aren't doing anything. And man, it it feels bad. No, yeah, I totally agree. For sure. Yeah, yeah it I, it feels really really bad. Maybe a bit loud. Our little alert there was a bit loud. Okay, I'll turn down the volume of it. Um, let's see what else people are saying here. Seeing that uh, uh, crossbow stonks are down due to unleash change being rough. Yeah, but on the other hand, stuff is less durable now with the amulet change, so it's kind of a mixed bag. If you're trying to, if you're using crossbows to kill heroes, they're a lot better, which was one of their weaknesses, right? Like one of their weaknesses was you couldn't punch through these three up save mock crushes with uh, save stacking. That was one of the main reasons we use long strikes instead of crossbows was because of that. Um, but now with the amulet change, that's a lot easier to do. So you, they, they might even be better now than they were before, frankly. Yeah. Um, they can kill Gargans the, the, reliably. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I was thinking about that, and uh, I was thinking about what Gargans might do, um, and I've been like discussing it with a few Gargan players. I think, uh, realistically, I think we're going to see some Kragnos lists, because mm -hmm. you don't want to go up, be a four mega Gargan player and go up against Kragnos. No, no. If you <laughs> if you, you have Gargans you. and he has Kragnos and yeah. you don't have Kragnos, you lose. It's just a hard loss. Yeah, you You're lose. not going to beat Kragnos. Yes. You can't charge him first. Yep. He will charge you, and every time he charges, he does devastating damage. So like, yeah, like Craig he has to roll wins. like one six and one five, and he's deleted a guardian on yeah. the charge, and then his attacks will take care of another one. It's it's like playing uh, Stormcast Mirror without Signs of the Storm. You're gonna lose straight yeah. up. There's yeah, it's happening. Yeah, so I think Gargan players. I think that list switches to. Um, Kragnos, two War Stompers, and a and a, a Man Crusher, or uh, two Gate Breakers, Kragnos, and a Man Crusher, and yeah. that gives them, I think, 1950, 1940 points out of 2,000. So that gives them enough for a triumph, basically. Yeah, and Gargans or, themselves. You know, are... If you're 19, at... yeah. Go ahead. Oh, yeah, they're gonna go for 19. If it's 1940, they'll go for the Emerald Ice Swarm, go for the Arcane Tome on one, and try to do some healing that way. Yeah, they they'll probably pivot to taking Master of Magic with Life Swarm. I can definitely see that. Um, the, the healing output is very strong. I could also see them maybe teching in Master of Magic and Geminids if they have the points left over from some combination. I um, don't... Yeah, no, I don't think so. You don't, don't think so? Mm. No, not Kragnos and two Mega Gargan lists. Kragnos, one Mega Gargan and Man Crusher lists, yeah, those could. But the ones that are um, two Mega as a Man Crusher and Kragnos, those are like 1935, 1940, and Geminids, I think, believe is 80 points. Yeah, that's too tight for Geminids. Yeah. Okay. Um, 
let's 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 do a little more structured conversation here. Um, so let's let's these are the big changes as I saw them. Um, we may have missed something. Uh, something could come up that's like, oh, we forgot to upload this document, and here's a whole bunch more errata. They've done that before. When they do an FAQ release, sometimes they just forget a document and then upload it the next day. Uh, sometimes they'll go back and re-upload something, like they'll errata their errata pretty quickly. So we're just going off. Mm -hmm. This is the day the Battle Scrolls released. This is what we're going off of here. And these are the big changes that I've seen that are worth having their own little discussion about. Uh, and those are going to be, obviously, Archaon, Nagash, Kragnos. Those are the big three, right? Uh, those are the ones that are going to... Uh, I think totally shake up the meta right now because we are in a monster meta uh, that is shaped around Archaon and Nagash in big part. Uh, but Kragnos has been completely absent from the competitive meta, and that's going to change. That is definitely yeah. going to change. Kragnos is... Yeah, the Era of the Beast has started, officially. This is it. We're finally starting the Era of the Beast a few months late. Um, yeah. After that, the other Agreed. big changes are Amulet of Destiny... That's really big, but it's not just for Gargans. It's really big. It has a big impact on Iron Jaws, on Stormcast, oddly enough, even though we have Gardas. Mm -hmm. uh, that does have a big impact on us. It has a big impact on Seraphon, I would say. Uh, any army with 12-plus wound hero monsters that was just slamming it in their list, That that's different now, for sure. Um, Unleash Hell. Cool too. Cool. Yes, yeah. yeah. Yeah, the Vulture Boss would take it, or uh, the guy on the... the I forget what those things are called. Sludge Boss. Sludge yeah. Boss, the, yeah. The Swamp, the Poison Dealers yeah. or whatever, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Unleash Hell has changed to something a lot more sensible and reasonable. I think people were talking about this ever since they first revealed the first uh, first rules for AOS 3.0 was that Unleash Hell, is the issue with it wasn't a damage thing. It's not just the amount of damage that you take when charging it. It was how easy it was to use and how safe it was to use. I think that's always been mm -hmm. people's issue with it. So I think they made the right changes in there. Um, yep. Heroic recovery. I think I actually specifically wrote about this exact change to not let it be used while you're in melee. I think I wrote about that when AOS 3.0 started, back before we had the Stormkeep. When I was posting on TGA, I, I definitely made yeah, a post yeah, talking that. about this. So I'm glad they did that, and I'm glad they removed the the alternate one slash D3 healing. Um, yeah, just yeah. I never understood that because this yeah. is a weird thing to track. There's just so much like bookkeeping. Like, just, you know. yeah, really weird. Especially because they removed bravery buffs for the most part across the board. So, yeah. why even have it? It's just a weird thing. Yeah. Um. Yeah. There's also small changes to Marathi and Alarial. Kind of just a jumping off point for for a conversation later. Um. Then there's the points. There's a lot of point changes that just don't matter at all. They won't make any difference. Um, I, most of them are like that, but there's some that are definitely worth talking about that are going to be significant enough to change how we how we approach our list building and how we approach other matchups. And then uh, we'll just have a quick discussion, like summarize it all up, five big winners, five big losers. I feel like that'll be the, the format of this live stream that we've put together in less than 12 hours. It's pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> As a person invested in Storm Drake, I'm scared of Craggy now. See, well, well he did lose his rerolls. Yeah, so. he doesn't reroll against them anymore. But they are monsters, so if you get charged, you're going to take a lot of damage and give him a lot of victory points. So definitely a reason not to run monsters right now is because the alpha monster Kragnos is here to kill all the other monsters. What I want. What's hilarious is the Annihilator's lists can like trigger his Bellow of Rage so many yep. times <laughs> that he can, if he's in a castle formation, he'll just end up like killing his army. Oh yeah, army. yeah. That's that's the one saving grace is that Kragnos hurts his own army. So you kind of, it's going to be interesting to see how much damage players are willing to accept in order to get a three d six charge aura. Because if you're in range of the aura, you're also in range of Bellowing Roar. So yeah, it's going to be a balancing act. We'll see how that works out for them. They'll have to go one drop, right? Like, if you're using Kragnos, you have to go one drop. There's no way about it. If you let your opponent go first, you're just giving them a bunch of uh, meteors that you can launch at your army. Like, it, it's just yeah. really downside. Uh, Reaper Time, Daniel Gomez, says, uh, Ma Crusher with no amulet is super nice. Yeah, bud. Agreed. I I am so yeah. sick of seeing Ma Crushers roll five up wards. It's the most frustrating thing. It's like, no, you're not, you're not a stone horn. You shouldn't be this yeah. durable. Plus they gain wounds. It's even it gets worse as yeah. the game goes on. Like it's just uh, no, it's terrible. So absurd. 
Uh, Crypt Shadow, does the Unleash Hell to 6 inches make the 7 inch Deep Strike OP? Uh, it doesn't interact in that way because you have to finish your charge in order to trigger Unleash Hell. So it doesn't matter where you start your charge, it matters where you finish it. But it does make the Annihilator, uh, Crypt Shadow, uh, the Annihilator list, it does make it better. Um, because a lot of times what's happening is you would, like, I would charge something like, I don't know, Tekla standing next to 20, 30 Sentinels, and I would eat Unleash Hell because as long as it was within 9 inches of the unit, now it is within 6 inches of each model. So at best, I'm going to eat maybe like 6 or 7 Sentinel shots, unless I charge them directly. Which means, you know, sure, I'll eat maybe two mortal wounds and then pile in and kill the sentinel or something. Mm -hmm. it, it makes those matchups a lot better, for sure. And we're going to have a whole yeah. discussion about it. it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, Brandon says, I was hoping for the big dragons to go down 20 to 30 points. Yeah, me too, man. I was hoping a lot of stuff in our army would go down 20 to 30 points. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't think that it can realistically happen unless they change the Draconic Breath flame stream or whatever it's called. Like, you think so? On on Krondis and Karazai? That's not really an issue. Oh, 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 no, 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 sorry. I thought you meant Stormdrake. No, no, Krondis, Karazai, yeah, definitely. I think after the Menagerie change and the fact that, you know, they don't know the whole lore like all these god figures do now, I think, yeah, I realistically, I think they could drop 40 points, mm -hmm. 40, 50 points. What I would rather see is them get better rules to be worth their points, because I don't mind paying 600 points for a big centerpiece monster. I really like that, especially if they're impactful. But, like, mm -hmm. if the rules aren't good enough, then it feels bad. So if, if they do stuff like, you know, Krondis learns every spell, um, maybe Karazai wish, gets a fight first. I wish Karazai game. had like a, yeah, maybe, I wish Karazai had something tied to a monster section. Like he he feels yeah. like that, you know, he's, he has all this bent up like rage, maybe yeah. tie something to a stomp or to tie something to make his roar like a mega roar. Like, you know, if he roars you, you can't do something else either. Yeah, make him uh, be able to use a rampage even if you've used that rampage already or something. Just some thing yeah. to represent his fury and anger besides just having a couple extra attacks would be cool. Yeah. Do mock crushes even take the amulet at this point? They seem super easy to alpha with, with Thunderbolt Volley and Long Strikes now if they don't take it. No, they don't. They probably yeah. move on to... Uh, let me see this artifact because I have the book. I think... Uh, I think it's pivoting to Kragnos is a legitimate idea for Iron Jaws now. I think, uh, or running double Mock Crusher, so you have redundancy. Because one Mock Crusher will die for sure before you get in, and having a second one still opens up the option to use the three command thing across. I think you mm -hmm. you go... It's tough. Six up ward is still good. Like, it's, it's not bad, but it's not reliable enough to keep them alive. So you have to assume you're going to lose a Mock Crusher on the way in. And if you don't, that's great. Just bonus, right? But assume you do. A 5-up ward on Krondis or Karazai would be good, uh, but we have that. It's called Gardas, and now he's cheaper than he was before. Yep. <laughs> yeah, he went down by 10. Oh, my God. I can't believe I that. I was like, yeah, I was like, there's no way. Is that Gardas going down by 10 points? Wow. Unbelievable. It's actually unbelievable that we dodged every single nerf, given how much discussion there is about long strikes and fulminators. It's crazy. But to be fair, oh, after the don't even get, yeah. after the Nurgle book, long strikes and fulminators are not looking that hot because they can't kill some of these key units in that army, right? So maybe yeah. just the natural evolution of the game will take care of this issue for us. Uh, like on average, yeah. even I've with plus one, said, yeah, even with plus one plus one, four fulminators does not kill four plus coil blight lords. It it gets like twenty five yeah. damage on them instead of the thirty two you need. It's still a lot of damage, but it shows yeah. that you know this this high output unit is supposed to delete anything it touches. If it gets stuck in, in prolonged combat, it, it gets a lot less valuable. So Sir Leaf says, what's well, up, I gang? A... Happy our army didn't get nerfed. Shame for no buffs. I'm still advocating for Dracolines. Yeah, sorry, we're gone. Finish your Yeah, thought. those needed to drop. Oh, yeah, no. What I was saying is people are actually playing the Glockkin, and his counter charge ability shuts down Fulminators. Yeah, it's it's if it's quite strong. If Fulminators, they're... Yeah, their that damage output just like goes flat, you know. It it's one of the reasons be, Glutkin popularity would be one of the reasons I would consider running Geminids, for sure, because it stops him from. Doing oh yeah, that. so he can't issue that. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah, and if you're using Geminids, crossbows are excellent with that, and Storm, Sora Storm Drake Guard getting an extra point of rend on their swords is fantastic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think uh, Iron Jaws is going to pivot to either uh, Arcane Tome and Master of Magic for that um, flaming weapon. Or um, 
I think they, they're going to go for Armor of Gork, which is basically the same as Amulet of Destiny, but it gives them one to their add one adds one to their hit rolls permanently. I, I could see them going Ma Crush a Master, teleport forward into Kragnos Aura, and then 3d6 charge forwards. I can definitely see that yeah. being a strategy for them as well. Maybe even double Ma yeah. Crush a Kragnos, just go full Monster Mash with minimum battle line. Would the points work out? Yeah, that would be like 1,500-ish, oh, yeah. right? Maybe No, it's because 720 plus 480. Oh, they're 480. 480. There's no points left for battle line, uh, is there? there? Yeah, there's no. Th there'd be nothing left for battle line. Oh, They'd yeah. get like two Gorgarpas in, I think. Or no, not even that, because Gorgarpas went up by 20. Maybe two Brutes in, that's it. Yeah. Couldn't fit or, a third. Yeah, three Art Boys could do it. Yeah, three Art Boys would do it. That could... Art Boys are what, 90 points? If the points work, I could see that. I could see that being a good, not a maybe not a good list. I don't want to go that far, but um, yeah, you, you you move one forward with mighty destroyers. You teleport one forward, and then you uh, have Kragnos in range so that they both get a three d six charge. And then you're triple charging with these units. Like that's a really good alpha strike, and that's how a lot of armies mm -hmm. used to play in second edition, right? You got the the flesh eater cords had yeah. that with the zombie terror guys stuff. It was, you know, that's a common trope. I can... We've seen that before. Yeah. I can see them going like Mega Boss on foot instead of Maw Crusher, and mm. then like just a ton of Brutes and Gruntas just rushing at your face with Mighty Destroyers because there's a trait that lets them issue Mighty Destroyers again, and the foot guy issues it to two units, so that's four units that can double move. Mm -hmm. um, brutes and Brutes are good, Gruntas are still good, and then Kragnos just for the three D six aura. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah, just pivot away from Maw Crushers entirely and and substitute Kragnos instead. I can see that. Mm -hmm. Kragnos is very good. Yes. Uh, George... Basically, yeah, destruction players are going to love him. Uh, George Octavio Lopez Serpa, I hope I pronounced that right, it's a very long name. Uh, Storm Drake Guard viable in any competitive list? Got demoralized after the menagerie change. Yeah, we were we were all demoralized too. Um, Storm Drake Guard are interesting because they are a, uh, they're kind of like the melee version of long strikes. Their damage output isn't the best in our book. Uh, but they have a really long threat range. They're super fast. They have a lot of unique utility. So they're they're like a, in terms of strategy, they're like a melee version of long strikes. Now, the problem with that is that if you pair it with the wrong units, they're not going to do everything you need them to do, right? Like if you run Storm Drake Guard alongside a Karazai, for example, you're going to be way too focused on melee units. You're not going to be able to tear down screens. You're going to get bogged down and, and shot to pieces by certain lists. Uh, if you go... Uh, long strikes in Storm Drake Guard, you're going to, um, it's not a lot of screening units. You, you, you spend a lot of points on the Storm Drake Guard, and, and long strikes really like a nice, tight defensive formation to protect them throughout the whole game. Um, you really want redundancy because double turns happen, and you want to make sure you have enough mm -hmm. stuff in the way, even in case of a double turn. Because if you lose those long strikes, you lose the game, right? So if you pair the drakes, my favorite pairing right now is with crossbow adjudicators. They seem to offset all the downsides of the storm drakes. They have a ton of wounds. They don't need to be protected like long strikes do. They have a ton of damage. I think uh, they do about 30% more damage than long strikes do. Yeah, they, they straight up do more damage against everything except two up saves. So crossbows and drakes are really good. I think that there's a lot of potential in that kind of list. You you pair it with all kinds of typical support heroes, you know, Relictor, Gardas, Encantor, Castellant. You put these pieces together and I think you have a competitive list for sure. I don't think the dragon spam lists are any good. I think we have enough tournament data to show that they are just not as scary as people thought they were going to be. Maybe not enough yet to know that for sure, but I think initial impressions are they're just not that scary. Um... So, so I, I I'd phrase it a little bit differently. I'd say they are scary, but not for some of the newer armies out there. I'll put it that way. Yeah. Like, Nurgle has the Nurgle has the five up wards to keep dealing with the mortal wounds from the Drakes. Um, we have Scions of the Storm. We can shoot something off, charge something, and you know have it have it ha have that be our main tool against it. Um, cool boys could probably deal with it, considering like dragons basically can't breathe fire on like a bunch of bulk boys that are in cover if they use the cover on mud dirty trick. It's just that there are some matchups where, like, if you're like a straightforward Warhammer list, like if you're playing Death, um, if you're playing like I don't know, I've met Deepkin, like yeah, you're gonna get fried. Like the flame streams will just fry you. Well, we'll we'll see, man. This new Nagash is really exciting for Death players. Um, being able to use it in all sorts of Death armies is really really cool. Mm -hmm. uh, we have our first super chat. I wasn't okay. Uh, five bucks from or four ninety nine from Morza. Thanks, man. Uh, do you want any? Do you have any kind of message? You want to toss in there with it? 
Cool. <laughs> oh, yeah, no problem, man. We're going to try to answer as many questions from the chat as we can. Shall we get into the meat and potatoes? Why is there a 10 second get delay into it. on that? That's weird. All right, let's try to fix that. Uh, okay, yeah, let's talk about um, our first topic here is going to be Archaon. So what's changed with Archaon? Um, I'm not going to do like a whole War Scroll breakdown. I'm going to give you guys the, the you know, top down, low resolution changes to him, just like cold notes, <laughs> right? I don't want to do a War Scroll review. I don't want that to be the thing that we do here. Um, so here's the highlights as I can see. And if, and if I missed anything, please let me know. Because again, everything came out less than 12 hours ago and we were all at work. <laughs> Uh, so, first up, he can be included as a coalition unit in Magatkin, Heat Knights, Disciples of Zinch, and Blades of Corn. right? Uh, he can't be included in Skaven armies or Beasts of Chaos, which, uh, you know, NPC armies, I guess. <laughs> Just gotta deal with that. Um, if he's included in those armies, he does not get any Allegiance abilities at all. He just can't benefit from them. That means you can't, you know, as a unique character, he couldn't get enhancements anyway, but this also prevents him from getting um, affected by any abilities from that Allegiance. And he always counts as the general, which is a nice little thing. I, I, I like this rule. I hope they do more of this because it's very thematic. Uh, a lot of Stormcast dudes could have this rule, right? Like Bastion. Bastion, easily. Celestin Prime should probably have it, given his, he's the second in command of the entire army after Sigmar. Um, Krondis mm -hmm. or Karazai really seem like they ought to have it, considering they're like, it goes like Sigmar up here, and then there's like a branch, and the Celestid Prime runs all the storm hosts, and then on the other side there's Krondus and Karazai. They're like the second in command in as as well, right? Like they don't answer to anyone, which is cool, uh, but they it's don't. A, yeah, they only like. Yeah. Uh, Gardus would probably have that if he's if he's a Hallowed Knights army. Uh, Gavriel seems like he should have that ability. Um, no, I think Gardus and Gav don't shouldn't like. It's like it, it's not there on some you know named chaos lord or anything like it's not on corgo's cool or i don't know arch cavalo xantos it's just on like god level characters so i agree like prime selson prime Carthalos. um actually not even Carthalos, because technically he's only hammers of sigmar if general on for him like because you can't you should be able to take him into some other storm host and have him be the general um yeah i think Krondus cares i saw some prime definitely yeah Yeah, sorry. Um, so Arcan doesn't have any faction keywords, so he doesn't have the Maggotkin of Nurgle, he doesn't have Blades of Corn, he doesn't have those things. So even if you do include him as a unit and you have some buff that's like, uh, you know, give a Maggotkin of Nurgle unit plus one hit, he can't get that, which is great. So he, he's basically just the War Scroll as you take him. Uh, he's, he's basically an allied unit at this point. So except he goes around the allied unit restrictions. That's really the only reason not to make him an ally. It's just, yeah. Mm -hmm. pretty straightforward stuff um unlike archaon his his or sorry unlike nagash his uh weapon profile and stats they're all the same nothing's changed with respect to that so you know that's good i guess um but a lot of his special rules have changed and here's the ones i've noticed maybe i i missed one here or there uh, so the first one i noticed and this one i hated this rule for so long the armor of morkar uh, now, it, yeah. it, if it reflects mortal wounds, it has to reflect them to a unit within three inches. And I always hated the fact that I would I would headshot Archaon, and some of my long strikes would die as a result of it. I've always <laughs> always hated that mechanic. It was very strange, um, and that's just not a problem anymore. Uh, if you have anything in melee, you you could be headshotting your own liberators, which would be uh, unfortunate. So just watch out for that, I guess. Uh, got another super chat here from Matt P. It, he says, so now that Death, Chaos, and Destruction have Apex General models, what do we think they will do to fill that hole in order? That's an interesting idea. I figured it would be Krondus. He definitely seems like the general leader type. He's very regal and refined. Um, maybe Order's not going to have one. Maybe Order has a whole bunch of different ones because we have Teclas for Lumineth, we have Alarial for the Sylvaneth, we have Marathi for the, the Daughters of Cain. Like we have lots of different We have the god Pantheon. Models. Yeah, we've got a whole bunch of different god models. Maybe Order isn't meant to have a single one that just goes in every faction. In, in first edition, it probably would have been Celestin Prime 
I think that was their design goal was that he was supposed to be like this uniting force that everybody would utilize because he had abilities that affected order units specifically. So maybe they just changed their mind since then and, and they want people to buy more I think, than one yeah, I uh, think... big model. Yeah, I think they don't go for that because like, and I don't know how to say this, like, I guess chaos is more hero driven than order is, if that even makes sense. Like order rosters aren't, it, it's weird that chaos has so much flexibility in how to construct their rosters in terms of coalition and everything, but they really are driven by their characters. Like they're not, you know, a war scroll based faction. Whereas order armies are not necessarily driven by some war master. They're sort of like, they're organized units, they're armies. Yeah. Not it's, some horde, not not a horde commanded by a war master. It's thematically appropriate for each of those apex models, as you call them. I like that term. I'm gonna keep using it a lot right now. Um so like the apex death model is Nagash. He's the god of death. He went around eating all the other gods of death. It makes sense for him to work this way, especially because each faction there has a specific tie to him. Uh Kragnos, same thing. He's the god of destruction. He's so much better at destroying things than everybody else that everybody kind of just looks at him and is like, yep, we're gonna fight with that guy. He's going to do the things we want him to do. Uh, like how the Cruel Boys were trying to get him to, uh, I forget their exact plot, but they wanted to like poison everything using Kragnos' rage, like trying to bait him into yes. fighting stuff. So that was pretty cool. Um, and then Chaos has Archaeon, but he doesn't feel the same because like Skaven don't care, Beasts of Chaos don't care, um, Chaos Dwarves probably don't care about Archaeon. They might give him some some equipment here and there, but. Uh, there's there's chaos isn't quite the same as de as death and destruction and then order is definitely more fragmented in terms of of story uh noah says yeah i, I think, think order the, is mainly together for convenience yeah yeah now uh, noah says i think the order god is gotrick he they're too disunified at the moment to have a single god gotrick's an interesting interesting idea i don't think he's the uniter right he's not the guy who's going to be the general at the front of the army he's the guy who shows up because he has his own reasons to be there he's got his personal agenda and he's just happens to be fighting alongside whoever he's with he's he's not rallying armies together that's not his deal mm -hmm. yeah i think every time order fights together it's always like some uneasy alliance or an alliance of convenience like hey we should probably just ally and like fight together because otherwise both our civilizations are screwed thanks to chaos yeah so Nobody really likes each other in order is what I'm saying. Like Sigmar doesn't trust anyone. Yep. Teclas doesn't trust anyone. Marathi doesn't trust anyone. I would love it if there was a death faction that just didn't care about Nagash. Like they were explicitly anti-Nagash. I would really like that. That would be a cool story hook. I would love to see that flesh. Yeah, flesh eater courts were that for a while. Yeah. Like, the, like, yeah, because uh, from what I've seen, uh, this was in, I think, Broken Realms Teclas too. Like one of the reasons, so Archon basically recruits a bunch of flesh eater reinforcements to help them out. And what the Luminates start burning their bodies so the Osir Blood Reapers don't get any material for making new armies every time they win a battle or lose a battle. So they basically go and attack the flesh eater courts and like use their bones yep. <laughs> as the uh, Osseus material. That's the only like inter depth fight I've ever seen. And uh, there was also when the Night Hunt attacked Lethus in Forbidden Power. If you recall, that's when uh, Celestine Prime got yeeted by the Hourglass, the magic MacGuffin that she just happened to be carrying the whole time and never used until she fought the one guy who insta killed. You know, yeah. like it's like carrying a, a revive potion and you fight an undead monster, like who? And this was dead. Um, <laughs> yeah, in that battle, uh, they actually had the Flesh Eater Courts. They were they were like paying back some debt that they felt that they owed. They were like the cavalry that came in in the last minute and saved them from the traitorous fire slayers, which was a really really cool moment, a very really cool angle for that. So they've never been like a, a, a Nagash, you know, buddy faction, um, but they they do have ties to Nagash. Hopefully they expand it, you know, and and maybe just one sub faction uses Nagash and the rest uh, are tied to Usharan closely. Or whoever they decide mm -hmm. is actually Usharan, even though they, I think I think they've even name dropped him at this point. Yeah. 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 So we'll see what the Apex Order will be if there ever will be one. Uh, if if there is, it has to be Sigmar, right? I don't think anybody any other model in the story could take that role. It has to be a Sigmar model that would do that. Yeah. Or maybe like a revamped Celestin Prime model where he really is like the avatar of Sigmar. Celestin Prime or the of Sigmar. Yeah. Primest. Primest. <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, okay, another change right. with Archaon. Uh, his By My Will ability, which was a command that he issued to any slaves to Darkness keyword unit, it gives them the ability to fight when they die. Now this affects any Chaos unit. So I started thinking, what's what's like the most hilarious combo you could think? Like really punchy hammer units that have trouble getting their damage in before they die, or just you know something your opponent has to deal with. So I thought my first mm. two thoughts were were Blight Kings and Scarbrand. I think that would be pretty hilarious to make them fight on death. Yeah, Scarbrand would be a lot of points with Archeon and so many Scarbrand. <laughs> so many yeah, points. Like, I want to say that's like. <laughs> 13, 1400 points on its own, or no, like at least 1200, 12, 1300 points on its own. But yeah, there, there's some units like so. Previously, it affected Slaves of Darkness, so Varengard and Marauders and Chaos Chosen were always in the range of it. Um, when I think of stuff that wants to fight when it dies, anything that has you know resemblance on mortal wounds on sixes, um, mm. I don't know, blood letters maybe. I don't that's, even know. That's all I can think of. There's yeah, gotta be Rathmongers. Some... Is there like a heat a Hedonite hammer that really wants to fight twice per turn in this way? Like super fragile and, and is willing to just die. I can't really but then you gotta pay eight sixty for that ability, right? So you need multiple rounds of value out of it. So you have to be running like a full melee army. I just don't know what really wants to use it. Blight Kings seem like the best choice for me because they're durable, right? So your opponent's gonna be putting a lot of damage into clearing them out. And every time they do, you're yeah. trading up tremendously. So I can definitely see that combo. I don't know if it's worth the points, but it's a combo. I guess you could also do it on like hero models. Like there's nothing stopping you from taking Bellicor and Archeon in the same list, right? Unless That's it's true. the unit of the first prince. So making Bellicor, you know, fight, and then if he dies in the swing back, make him fight when he dies again. Yeah, he could always do that, though. It used to be any Slaves to Darkness unit, so any combo that existed previously yeah. still exists, like Varangard. Probably not punchy enough with the Ren 1 in this meta. I, mm -hmm. Well, possibly... actually, don't they get the Mortal Wounds? Because they have a bunch of attacks. And Mortal Wounds on 6s, I believe. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, with the Ensorcelled Weapon. Because then right? you can... Yeah, because... So here's some, that's something very interesting. So Varengard fight twice normally, right? Like, mm -hmm. they activate twice. So they have a bunch of attacks there. This is technically not a fight twice ability because it affects models, not units. That's correct. The core rules say that only units can fight. Units cannot fight more than twice. So when the models die, they can still fight. So you could effectively get three activations out of a Varengard, which is not bad. Yeah, but that always existed. So that we're talking about the new stuff, right? Um, mm -hmm. Maybe we'll see more Archaeon in Slaves to Darkness list instead of just seeing him in Zinch list pretty much exclusively. But we'll see about that. Uh, another change I noticed is that the Slayer of Kings has received a very minor change in wording. Uh, and I don't think anybody even played it this way, but it was technically correct. So before it said, if you deal, uh, if two of your wound rolls have a, a, a six in the same phase, then the hero is instantly slain, right? So if you fought, did a mortal wound on a six, or sorry, did a wound roll of six, and then fought again using a fight twice ability, and did another wound roll of six, then you would instant kill almost never occurred and almost nobody played it this way because why would you right now it says each time you fight so it has to all be within a single fight phase so it is technically nerfed but whoever played it in that way i don't even know when that would have been relevant so i think this is just cleaning up the rule yeah i agree and the last big changes here are he's he's a little more expensive he's 30 points more and he's got new damage brackets. I think this one slid under the radar for a lot of people, but it seems like they're going towards this um, higher damage brackets in general. Like you take four wounds, you get weaker. No more of that. It's going to be like you take yeah. eight to ten wounds. Close like, to half. Yeah, yeah. Pretty, pretty close to half your health, and then you start feeling something. So you can't just pepper mortal wounds on something, and then that's enough to bracket it. You have to actually dedicate damage into it in order to weaken it. So not sure how I feel about that quite yet. I mean, it's fine, honestly. Like with the short, with how the board, um, I guess size has gotten smaller, and it, it's not going to affect you much because the only thing, like, if you look at most of these war scrolls, the only thing that really affects is a movement, b, like it'll be like one attack profile, something on the mount or something, because the rider is almost never affected. Um, yeah, it's not like forty so k. Always like some. Yeah. Well, it's, it's not changing any of his hit profile or two wound profiles. It's normally like some attacks and then the movement. Um, eight to 10 inch movements, even on the lower brackets, is still incredibly like fine. 
Like yeah. he's a flying monster. He'll get where he needs to go. He'll already be like in the mid board, ready to dedicate himself to some point. Yeah, uh, yeah I, I just like I feel like brackets aren't that impactful in Age of Sigmar. Now they are if your your hero can't heal at all. Like if Marath, if you're like Marathi, then yeah, that that totally matters. Um, but if you're Archeon and you got the, the I believe it's the Nurgle head that lets him heal, um, or Cornate head or something, mm -hmm. um, then you know like who cares. Chase in the chat says, I wonder if Vlad or Isabella are coming back. That would be an excellent way to introduce an anti-Nagash faction. Not just Nagash apathetic like Flesh Eaters, but straight up anti-Nagash. Like they have a reason to hate Nagash. Vlad and Isabella coming back as like twin gods of death or something. That would be sick. I'd really like that. Well, right now Nagash has been banished by Teclas. So they, Vlad yeah. might use this opportunity to establish his own little faction. So that could be an interesting little... <laughs> drama piece and he, you know, he was yeah. banished uh, but still s posting from beyond whatever the grave is for him like he's still like well, yeah, texting techless and he, he is <laughs> yeah <laughs> he's dead so he's like techless gets sad every every now and then just picture like your techless and your phone is blowing up because you beat up this bully <laughs> and it's in all caps like i'm gonna get you you're not gonna live through this I'm gonna... <laughs> basically uh so uh, Archaon, um he, he seems weaker overall to me, right? Not being able to benefit from allegiance abilities is is the big one, which means no more fate dice for him. You can still use Kairos, but can't do fate dice anymore. So that combo is a lot, a lot weaker. Um, will people run Archaon and Kairos together? I doubt it. That's a really expensive combo. The rest of your list is just, especially with horrors going up, the rest of your list is just so bad. Uh, just low unit counts across the board, no ability to take damage or deal damage, I think. It's probably not viable. Um, what do you guys think about Archaon changes overall? Better, weaker, about the same? What are we thinking? Um, I'm thinking... So with the points and with the uh, Allegiance ability change, he's definitely not so much of an auto-take in uh, Disciples of Zinch. Um it does hit armies that are sl slightly on the weaker scale, like Slanesh and Blades of Corn, a little bit because they were sort of depending on it. Oh yeah, Corn's dead. But I think overall, yeah, overall it's a good change because Corn really could buff him up to crazy levels because yep. he had some access to some good prayers. Uh, you know, Chaos War Shrine was always good. Um, I think he's like, but the thing is like the thing that was really broken about him, the rerolls, is something that they really only addressed with points. Like I'm surprised that Nagash doesn't get Nagash basically went through the same deal, but Archeon receives buffs from the Slaves to Darkness Allegiance, which means if you put an aura of Zinch on him, he's rerolling save rolls of one. You know, the Chaos Sorcerer Lord, who's like the Scooby-Doo villain of mm -hmm. the whole that whole book, you know, still enables that Lord Castellan save. He still has a reroll hits and reroll wounds. So it's just it's strange that I, I guess all Archeon players just revert to that list. Chaos Sorcerer Lord, Archeon, Demon Prince, and then you just sprinkle in whatever else. Yeah, so thing. it's but the problem with that is that to me, that sounds like a worse version of Legion of the First Prince, right? A lot of the same units, even. Yeah. Um, relying on blood slick ground. Archaon's tanky, but he's not going to kill anything. He's not. He's not a hammer unit. He's an anvil. He's a good anvil, but he's not a yeah. hammer by any means. His damage output is not good enough to deal with the meta. And at this many points, like well, the, the rest problem of is the things. Yeah, the things he wants to be killing with Slayer of Kings. They're just like. Yeah gods and they can't be killed <laughs> that's like, that's why he was can't be killed Marathi. yeah yeah that's why he was so good is because he could instant kill these big threats and then the low amount of damage that the rest of your list did was fine because the things you generally want to instant kill are big hero monsters um when archaeon had to fight lists that were like you know stormcast with just a bunch of fulminators and long strikes and these small support heroes like the heroes do nothing for stormcast they're not engaged yeah. in the combat at all archaeon had a tough time against those lists already and now that's just going to be his experience with every list. He's not going to do the damage you need for an 860 point model. Yeah, I mean, you'll they'll find ways to make him work. Uh, I still think he has three, two, four, one potential. I don't know how much Fibo because I don't know how he gets past Kragnos and Gargans. Exactly. Yeah, he's hard gate kept by. Well, Kragnos doesn't do that many mortal wounds to him on the charge because of his ignore, but just his damage. Kragnos's damage itself with the Ren three four damage yeah. mace is going to kill him. Yeah, so I, I mean, even if Kragnos, like, let's say, gets lucky and rolls, like, I don't know, like a five and five, and that's twenty-five mortal wounds. Even if Archeon ignores half, mm -hmm. you know, that's still, still a lot still, of damage. Still taking yeah. like twelve, 
Yeah, and then he only has eight health left, and then he all all Kragnos has to do is hit him with the minus three rent four damage mace, and there you go. Yeah, for sure. I I, I think Arcan. What the impact of these changes will be is that Arcan is no longer a meta defining force like he is right now. Right now, the meta is definitely mm -hmm. defined by Nagash, Arcan, Gargants, and then a few shooting lists here and there. Right, but th that's basically the meta. So with Archaon being taken out of this role as a gatekeeper list, like if you couldn't beat Archaon, what is your list doing at a, at a GT exactly? Like you're gonna face him at some point. He's a super popular model. You had to have a plan, right? Just like with Gargans, you had to have a plan to, to kill Gargans. And uh, he's, I think this knocks him out of that status. He's still gonna be good, just not mm -hmm. not the force he used to be. It's gonna strategically, he's a yeah. lot easier to play around because his damage is so low. And Chaos traditionally has bad ranged attacks. You can just tar pit him, screen him, play around him, just run past him, basically. He's only one guy. So it'll be interesting to see how Slaves to Darkness lists evolve around him. I don't see him being used that much outside of that. Yes, agree. What do you, what do you guys in the chat think about uh, Archaon? Send us your answers. And uh, in the meantime, James, have you had a chance to play against Archaon yet? I think you did, right? One of your first uh, games? Uh, it was one of the first games I played of third edition, and it was the first time playing against uh, one of the guys in our community here. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, he was intimidating by all means, but I didn't really know too uh, too well of any sort of strategy, so I can't really speak on that. Uh, he definitely still seems tanky right now. Uh, even if you take away his support piece, um, the changes to heroic recovery make him a little less tanky at this point. Mm. That's a big one that we didn't talk about. Uh, Archaon definitely is one of those those tanky anvil heroes that relied on heroic recovery. Uh, when he was stuck in melee, he'd heal off the the was it the Nurgle head? I think it was the Nurgle head that heals him. Uh, corn head, corn head, corn head. Him, okay, yeah. It's weird. So he'd yeah. he'd rely on the corn head and heroic recovery and crazy save stacking and eye of Sheeran. Like you added all these things these things together, and it seems like they took away his damage. They're chipping away at his durability. Uh, his long-term attrition durability. So incremental changes, I think, are going to push him out of this gatekeeper role. Definitely. Now, if you're shooting him, he's, he heals you know better than he did before because w you just have to roll a 10 to heal D3 instead of uh, you know healing 1 if you roll a 10. So his healing at range is well, a little bit better. Build, yeah. Yep. 2D3 pretty much each turn. So Just stick faster, my friend, then. then. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Noah Stella. Yeah, Bastion likes facing him now. Yeah. As long as you don't have liberators in, in range or fulminators to reflect those mortals, oof. <laughs> you might kill more yeah, of your own was... dudes. Yeah. Uh, Noah's saying, very eloquently put, my friend, Archaon kind of poo poo NGL, chief. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll see. I don't know yeah, if this could... point change was necessary to him. I, I just think, like, People were using him as a crutch in all these like chaos allegiances. I think it's fine. Like if he if he's meant to just prop up this laser darkness book, I'm okay with that. Like let's not have him introduced to like 50 other allegiance abilities from like three other books. I think that was always going to be broken because there's no way you can check for balancing that. Oh yeah, he's bravery 12 because of crown. I always forget about that bravery effect. Yeah, he's always healing D3 now, just guaranteed. Yeah. So. Yeah, I'm. I'm happy to see these changes because I'm tired of this model. It's been a, it's been plaguing me since it was released in 2016, I want to say. And it was just, there was always a guy at the local store who had one and I just, I'm tired of playing against it. I was happy at the end of second edition when he just wasn't seen because he just got shot off the table immediately. Um, and then I was disappointed when third edition made him playable again. I hope I don't get, I, I hope he's he's gone enough that I can stand playing against him again. I just get bored of it. Right, it's like playing against long strikes. You just get bored of it. Yep. Playing with long strikes too is pretty boring. Yeah, that can get. Yep. Yeah, it can get boring. Got to spice it up, man. Crossbow adjudicators. Now I'm gonna build storm strike chariots with bows. See how that goes. Oh, Be thunderbolt while you're there. <laughs> <laughs> you can't. They don't have Angelos. <laughs> don't they? No. They said they did. No, okay, they should. Okay. okay. They have the okay, Angelos yeah. thing on their shoulder, and in the fluff, they're they're mentioned. But it's like the leader of the Vanguard chamber not having the Vanguard keyword. It just <laughs> they'd be too broken with Thunderbolt. Oh yeah, <laughs> think of it, man. Two extra shots, hitting on three, wounding on three. 
Minus one, one? Yeah. Sorry. Unbelievable. <laughs> yeah. All right. Next, who's the next big baddie? So we're talking Nagash. about Nagash. Uh, Nagash, I, I like the Nagash changes a lot. Um, mm. Because they overall make him weaker in the way he's currently being used, which is really good for the game because the way he's currently being used is absurd. Uh, but it, it defines a completely new niche for him and opens him up to every death army, which I love. So uh, these, are the, these are the highlight changes here. So uh, first big one is he can be used in any death army now. Previously, he was not able to be used in Flesh Eater Courts or in Night Haunt, and that's changed. He can be used in any death army. Uh, he, like, like Archaeon, he always cancels the general. He can't get allegiance abilities. Uh, but interestingly, he can get spell lores because he's the god of death. He invented death pretty much, so he should he should get spell lores. He learns every spell in the army that he's in, I believe. So. Yep. Cool. He knows all the spells. Which is very, very fun. Unfortunately, yes. because he doesn't actually have the Night Haunt or Flesh Eater Courts or Bone Reapers keyword because they removed that thing in the battle traits, he cannot cast any faction endless spells. I'm pretty sure I looked through each one and there's every single one requires being a Night Haunt wizard or an o a faction Oceanic. wizard. Yep. Yeah. Keyword wizard. Spells. Yeah. So he just yep. can't cast any of the endless spells, which is a shame because Night Haunt endless spells are really good now. They're really good. Mm -hmm. The problem with Night Haunt is they didn't have a good enough hero wizard monster. They didn't have a centerpiece like Nagash. So um, honestly, I'm okay with that. Nighthawn has, like you said, not only are their endless spells good, their entire spell suite is amazing. Yeah. It's just that they always had mediocre units and heroes to put those buffs on. Mm -hmm. Like I don't know if y'all have seen Reaping Scythe. It goes off on like a four, which for Nagash is basically means get a two and a one on his thing. And it gives you full rerolls to hits and wounds. <laughs> yeah. Like, it's, it's nuts. nuts. It is. It, it, We'll talk about Night Hot Nagash in a bit. Yeah. Uh, so another thing is his melee profiles have changed, which is weird. I found this a very strange decision, um, but they increased. They gave him three more attacks to Alakanash, which is his biggest weapon. It's Rend three d six. Previously one attack, now it's four attacks at Rend three d six. So he's potentially doing a whole lot of damage in melee now, like real damage, not like Kragnos and and. You know, buffed up Celestin Prime levels of damage. This guy's an actual threat in melee now. Uh, but they did also yeah. reduce its wound characteristic by one, which is weird. Don't know why. It was wounding on twos, now it's on threes. Oh, uh, um, I think they did it because of the Night Haunt spell. Maybe. Because there's ways, and I think so. I think they did it because Soul Black Grave Lords and Night Hunt have ways to buff up wound rolls. There's always finest um, hour too, right? So like it's not yes. like you can still end up wounding on twos, but but here's a bigger one. Uh Zephet Neptar is my is now wounding on fours instead of threes. So even if you mm -hmm. get plus one wound, you're actually wounding like you're less accurate with that weapon, which is <laughs> yeah, mod arts 24 damage right there. Four attacks at D6. <laughs> I I don't know how I think they legit <laughs> don't know why they do D six like it's so bad like but whatever okay I guess they gave him four attacks so it's fine sure I guess they want to average it out to ten damage or something well he's he's a threat now right even if the average isn't that different he's a his spike potential is high so you have to treat him like that um, mm -hmm. and then his spectral claws have plus two to hit but they don't do moral wounds anymore. Which is weird, which makes me worry that Night Haunt are going to take the same route where the Spirit Hosts aren't going to have hit rolls of six to Mortal Wounds anymore, but are going to be more accurate. And I don't want that because that totally kills yeah. their flavor. So we'll see what happens in the Night Haunt Tome. On one hand, I would be happy to see less Mortal Wounds and less hit rolls of six causing Mortal Wounds. Like Nurgle has maybe the worst version of that effect right now with the disease mechanic. Terrible. Mm -hmm. Like just an awful way to do hit six Mortal Wounds, which I'm in favor for because. That's an insane mechanic, and it makes the game it makes armor matter a lot less. That's for dang sure. So yeah. Uh, so overall, Nagash's average damage is higher. I haven't crunched the numbers to know how much higher, but you know, you gain three attacks at Ren three D six. You're going to do more damage even if if your other attacks are minus one. Um, not as it's not just a strict upgrade though. It it you know you do take an accuracy loss, so that should be noted. Um, they changed his. Supreme Lord Does of the Undead. Matter, though? I'm, I'm like trying to think because like every time I see a Nagash player, all they're doing is like loading up the six or six or seven or eight arcane bolts. Maybe they'll cast one soul drain or something. Maybe some one other utility spell. 
It just, like, yeah. by and large. You play around like, Nagash the same way you did before. You just don't yeah. hit him unless you, unless he's already used his arcane bolts. You just don't get into melee with him. Yeah, because I can see him like using one utility spell from every lore that he knows, like reaping side maybe from night haunt just to get full rerolls and load up seven arcane bolts and just go into something and kill it. Oh yeah, all the spells are good. All the new, all the yeah. night haunt spells are good. Every single one. It's crazy. Um, so another thing they changed was his supreme lord of the undead is now a, a revive booster which is really, really cool. He's the god of the dead, and he's actually reviving stuff. Love this. Flavor-wise, this is a huge win. Um, so you can re-roll the dice determining the number of models that have been re-rolled, or you can just add one to the roll of the number of models that have been re-rolled. So if you're resurrecting flares, you can just resurrect another flare, which yeah. is great. You just, here you go. Here's another flare. Uh, if, you're res if you're doing a rally, then you can re-roll all the dice in the rally. If you have a block of 40 chain rasp and you're rallying 39 of them, you can reroll every single one. It's a stupid example, but <laughs> yeah. like that's awesome. That's really an good. awesome ability. That's really good. Yeah. Yeah. Now, and that's not just Nagash doing it, it's any revive that's happening in your army. So you could have a necromancer on the other side of the table doing uh, an invocation, if that's still a thing. I don't even know. Um, yeah, if, yeah. De uh, all slopes, all okay. great lords. I, I thought maybe the name zombies. changed. Um, yeah. So that gets boosted, right? Like every revive that your army does anywhere on the table, as long as the gash is on the table, is boosted, mm -hmm. which is awesome. Don't know how strong it is. Have no idea. Reviving zombies is going to be better, that's for sure. Like the gash and a I bunch of zombies. Yeah, I think it's really good on Flesh Eater Quartz. I don't know how much they'll use him, but it's really good on those Corporal Cliff Crypt Layer lists. It's really good on any zombie lists. Um, on OBR, it doesn't actually do anything for them because OBR already relies a fixed number of models, um, like three. They don't do like random. Yeah, you just... can't, OBR also cannot OBR also cannot use rally because it's a core command ability and they don't have access to them. Doesn't it just add but one to the do... amount of models re revived? Yes, yes. So it's, yeah. what it's really good for is Godzilla Harvesters because every time a model dies within three inches of them, they roll that four up and they get two more tech artifacts. Yep, that's exactly what I was going to say. Is that's so, so, yeah nuts. That's really good. That means if you kill 10 Mortec Guard near a a Harvester and they roll exactly average, you, you get all of them back. <laughs> yes. It was it was so stupid. Uh, I don't know if you guys remember, but the Gothazar Harvesters used to stack their effect. So if you had a Harvester and another Harvester and then Mortec Guard surrounding all of them, if you killed one Mortec Guard and, and as the OBR player, you get to choose which one died. If one of them was in range of both of them, then he basically just didn't die. Because you'd have two four ups to revive him, right? Yep. So on average, you, I, I don't remember the math. I did the math one time, but the the attempt to kill a, a block of Mortec Guard was something almost impossible, like statistically impossible with almost infinite damage. You still couldn't kill them. Like you would need <laughs> infinite damage yeah. effectively because of the the it just kept collapsing, right? The decimal places yeah. were were so insane. Um, this is basically well, that they, yeah. again. Yeah, this yeah, this is basically that. Yeah. But the only way to do it is to wipe out the uh, entire unit. You have to kill the harvester and you just have well, to. Well, also wiping out the unit. Like if you do enough damage to where they remove the entire unit off the board, it triggers at the same time, right? I'd have to look into that. I I remember in second edition this was a problem because you did it as you, because slain and removing were at the same time in second edition. In third edition yeah. it might not be a problem because slain and removal are, are at different timings now. So you could be right. I haven't right. looked into that specific interaction since they changed the harvester. Yeah, because if models are all slain at once and but removed one at a time, then it's it's different. Because if they're yeah. just slain, if all them if all of them die, then sure the gods of the harvester triggers ability triggers, but it cannot target a unit to return models to because that unit is dead. So No. I don't think that's right because units aren't destroyed until all models are removed and models are removed after all models are slain. We're going to have to look into okay. this. We're going to have to look yeah, into this because yeah, we'll... if this has created another double Gothazar Harvester situation, I'm, I can't, I, I won't be surprised, but I'll be yeah. upset because doing infinite damage is, is very hard to do in this game. <laughs> yeah, it's very hard to do. Um, that's a good way to put it. So Nagash has lost his super overpowered amazing command ability, which was the main reason why he was worth almost a thousand points. Uh, Rerolling hit, wound, and save rolls of one was absurd. And in second edition, not so much, but in third edition, that ability was 
so 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 good good god was it good um and now instead he has a command to issue in the combat phase at the start of the combat phase it adds one to ward rolls for a unit so this is much worse for most uses of nagash currently because rerolling yes. save rolls of one was so much better than adding one to ward rolls because you know every death unit has a six up ward um some of them will have a five up ward mm -hmm. so you can push this to a five up if you have a six or to a four if you have a five right so that's obviously worse in the current uses of Nagash. We're talking OCR Bone Reapers. We're talking um, Soul Blight Grave Lords. Typical Nagash list. This is a worse ability, especially for Nagash himself. He can't reroll save rolls of one, and he was really, really good at save stacking and then rerolling. So Nagash also doesn't have a six up ward anymore. That's correct because he doesn't yeah. have any allegiance. All the death saves are tied to allegiance. He does not get a six up death save anymore. He has a ward, but it's only for mortal wounds. And mortal wounds. he cannot use his new command on himself. It has to be a different death unit. Yep. But he can use it multiple times if you're playing Bone Reapers. So you can give yep. a whole bunch of different units plus one to ward saves, which is cool. Um, yeah. Where is this good? I think immediately my first thought is zombies have a five-up ward now in combat. So I was thinking Osiar Bone Reapers, actually. Just spread like, it around, yeah. Yeah, just give like 50 more tech guard, 5 up ward saves, maybe have a God of the Harvester behind them. <laughs> my my issue with that is Nagash is so expensive and his damage yeah. isn't that scary and when he's not when he and he's killable now, right? Like that's the big uh, Archaon's yeah, still he's super durable. Killable. Nagash is not yeah. anymore. Nagash is not a durable boy anymore. Yep. It it also forces yeah, it's the same problem of he needs to be in a one drop because otherwise he will get shot off the board every time. The, yep. And he can actually be shot off the board now, even though his armor mm -hmm. still lets him reflect mortal wounds at range, which I hate. I hate, hate, hate that. <laughs> they changed it. They I'm changed okay it with, with Archaon. Like for him, armor is like a magical construct. It's no, like it's his armor. armor. It's right. actually physical armor that he's wearing. <laughs> it's, the, it's no different but, from the yeah, other. But it's armor. ensorcelled. <laughs> That's the explanation. <laughs> sure. Why not? He's yeah. yeah. Magic. I'm a good writer. I'll just Maybe. use magic as the excuse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, magic. They don't have to explain anything. <laughs> Yeah, I think I think this new command makes um, skeleton warriors a lot better. I think it makes zombies a lot better. I think blood knights get a lot better because they they have that ability to reroll. I think they they have a banner that lets them reroll ward, ward rolls of one. Yeah, uh, reroll ward rolls of one. Yes. Yeah. So on a five up, that's better, right? Yes. So I think um, in ways like Nagash is not being currently used, he's a lot better in those same armies. So soul blight would pivot how they use Nagash, and Bone Reapers would also pivot how they use Nagash. They wouldn't just use him as this, like, unkillable anvil that's going to not, uh, 93 mortal wound something off the board every turn. Yeah. Uh, I mean, he'll just have to be placed a lot more, like, scalpel. Like, they'll have to place him a lot more strategically, because he can be killed. And he's, like... Um, and I think this... I, I want to say, like, Nighthaunt is really going to benefit, because they have that Cruel Gas Cruciator guy. Who gives something? Who has a five-up ward bubble? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, and the Night Hunter are gonna turning, be looking pretty good after yeah. this. Yeah, and turning that into a four-up ward bubble for like a whole bunch of Night Hunter units—that sounds really, really good. After an ethereal save, so a four-up ethereal save and a five-up five up rerolling <laughs> ones. Yeah. 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 Or four-up board, but yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Oof. Four-up rerolling. Yeah. Or sorry, just four-up. Yeah. Um. Somebody yeah. in the chat, Timothy, asked, "Can?" Gardas use his five up ward to reflect the mortal wounds from Nagash's armor. This is an interesting point I didn't mention earlier. Um, but the mortal wound from the armor of Morkar on Archaon cannot be negated in any way, which is cool. But the Nagash armor can be negated. So if you're playing against Nagash and he reflects mortal wounds, you can use a five up ward against that, I believe. Unless there's like some silly rule that because a ward was used. And then another ward can't be used because only one ward can be used for a wound. I don't think that would be the case. I'd have to look into the specific interaction. But you should be able to use Gardas against the reflected wounds from Nagash, but not the reflected wounds from Archaon. Best rules ever. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, very yeah, it's consistent. Consistent as all hell. Yeah. So Nagash, his points went down a little bit, which is not a big deal. Like who? 15 points is who's gonna care right you're spending 955 like another 15 wouldn't matter i don't know why they even bothered doing this 
And like Archaeon, he's got new damage brackets. So you have to put a lot of damage into Archaeon and Nagash in order for them to get bracketed, um, which is actually a bigger deal on Nagash than it was Archaeon because his casting gets worse, not just in the number of spells he can cast, but also just the bonus that he has too. So that that's actually a bigger deal. Like you have to take Nagash to 10 wounds before you, you knock him down to a, a significant cast bonus, right? Like knocking him down one plus one cast takes 10 wounds, which is huge. Um, yeah, so let, let's talk about the new uses of Nagash, because we talked about how we previously, uh, sorry, it was whiny. <laughs> <laughs> that tongue sticking out, that's amazing. Yeah, he's old, he doesn't have any teeth. So. <laughs> <laughs> Might be time to turn him into an imperitant type cloak, you know? <laughs> oh, come on, that's it's cool. Just... <laughs> That's adorable. All right. All right. Um, so let's talk about Nagash's new uses. Uh, Nighthaunt Nagash looks sick. Straight up looks really sick. The the Excruciator, like you said, uh, gives a five up board. You can add one to that. That's awesome. Um, but the, he's just a great piece for that army because a big problem with that army is they can't save stack right now. They don't have this big centerpiece defensive unit. They, they rely on, kind of like Stormcast, they rely on units to do their damage rather than heroes. And then here comes Nagash solving all these problems for you. He can save stack. He's a big fighty hero anvil guy. It's awesome. Nagash in Nighthaunt is going to be sick. Um, even if he just didn't cast any spells, he would have been good. But yeah, I had to refresh myself on the Nighthaunt spells. Um, and they're they're amazing. Nighthaunt have maybe the best spell lore in the game. Right. So let's mm -hmm. go through these. Uh, Soul Cage makes a unit fight last. That's insane. So... If, if you're stuck in any kind of attrition-based combat with Nagash, he's going to 8d3 mortal wound you and make another unit fight last. Insane. Uh, Reaping Scythe, he picks his his best weapon, and that gets full rerolls to hit and wound, which is super yeah. rare in this game. That's an incredible spell. Uh, he can Spirit Drain, which is like Bastion's ability to pick a unit, roll dice equal to its wound characteristic, and it just takes mortal wounds on sixes. So he's suddenly a good answer for Night Haunt to deal with Gargans, especially with the Amulet of Destiny nerfed. Mm -hmm. uh, Spectral Tether heals D3, right? Uh, Life Steal deals D3 and then heals D3. And Shade Mist gives an enemy unit minus one to wound rolls. All of these spells, he has really, all really of them. Strong. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, every single really one good. of these spells is worth giving up an Arcane Bolt for in a lot of situations. They're all very strong spells. Good God, yep. this is amazing. Uh, he can't cast the endless spells, like I mentioned, but they're all good. So if you take like a Rykonor and have him run alongside Nagash and then have him casting the, the Scythe and the Hourglass and all that stuff, that's that's good too. Not a lot of armies can yeah. deal with this many spells. It's so good. So, yeah, the debuff suite is great, yeah. And honestly, makes sense why they took away some of his healing. Um, yeah. Because in each of these armies, whatever he was available in, uh, he had the keyword, so he could heal. But now mm -hmm. Nagash can't heal himself at all. So he needs these spells, mm -hmm. basically. Oh, yeah, he's he's going to be stealing a lot of health from people. Between this and Soul Stealer, if it goes off. And he yeah. still has Hand of Dust. You can still spell Portal Hand of Dust exactly like you could before. Like, mm -hmm. it's nuts. No, but it's like it creates like a decision ladder. Like, what am I going to do? It's not it's not always as mindless as it used to be before. Mm -hmm. um, it's just him Arcane Bolt. His healing. Arcane Bolt. Yeah, him losing, Arcane Bolt. Yeah, him losing his ward and his inbuilt healing is pretty huge. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's one of the things that make him killable over you know, the next few turns. For sure, yeah. Um, especially the heroic recovery thing. That's another another big one. If you tie him down, um, you, you can end a unit in melee with him. Like Tie him down with screens and mm -hmm. stuff, and, and it's actually a viable tactic. Now, before, you would just stay the heck away from him. You'd never leave any units within three inches. But now you might actually want to do that to prevent him from healing D3, so you can snipe him on your turn. Uh, Noah... Are you going to talk about the weird bodyguard interaction with Hex Race that 100% isn't legal, but read as written can be argued? Sure, let's talk about that. So Archaeon and Nagash have abilities that specifically say they cannot benefit from any Allegiance abilities, right? That is a poorly defined phrase in Age of Sigmar. There's no clear definition for it. Um, in second edition, what this typically meant was that you couldn't get access to any enhancements, and if there were abilities that affected you, you couldn't use them. Right. Um, coalition kind of breaks that because coalition units typically do benefit 
from allegiance, not in the way that allies do. Um, if there's an ability that works on them, it's usually keyword restricted. For example, in first edition, you had to be a Sylvaneth keyword in order to get healed by regrowth, I think. Or no, no, before it, you, you didn't have to have the Sylvaneth keyword, but in second edition, they made it so you have to have that keyword. So there was a lot of discussion. Can a unit be healed with regrowth um, even though it's it's an ally, right? Because okay. the definition is can't benefit from allegiance. And people would say getting healed by a spell definitely counts as benefiting from the allegiance. The way they ruled it back then in first edition was, yeah, you can get healed by the spell. What we mean by this phrase is that you can't get enhancements, which is what, what we would call enhancements now. So hex rates in the Emerald Host, I believe, have an ability that says uh, your general if they take a wound, they can bodyguard for that general, right? And because Nagash always counts as a general, and because the way they've defined uh, this can't benefit from allegiance abilities thing in the past, it seems like it seems like hex wraiths can bodyguard for Nagash um, if you're playing the Emerald Host. Really, really janky. And the fact that I had yeah. to explain so much just to get to this rules interaction means you should probably not play it that way if you want to avoid arguments. If you really want to play yeah. this, talk to your TO ahead of time, for sure. This is one of those things that um, everybody's going to yeah, argue about. If you pull about. a gotcha, yeah. Yeah. If you pull a gotcha, they're likely to just like go against you, and the TO is likely to not allow it, so don't look back at them. Yeah. It's, it's such a weird interaction. I don't like when they have these poorly phrased things like can't benefit from allegiance, but they don't ever define allegiance or benefiting or any of this stuff. Uh, but, you know, it's the best rules ever. Uh, let's talk about Flesh Eater Nagash, who is, I really thought after looking at Night Haunt, I made the mistake of looking at Night Haunt first, and that set the bar like way up here for how good mm -hmm. Nagash is going to be. And then I looked at Flesh Eater Nagash, and I'm not nearly as excited. Um, I really tried to be. Uh, so he does get, you know, there's a lot of Flesh Eater spells that get bonuses to their effects if you cast them on a 10 plus. So Nagash getting a plus three minimum because he could have Arcane Terrain. Uh, he, he gets that bonus a lot more. But none, mm -hmm. of, none of them are that impactful. They're like, pick extra units instead of, instead of one, pick D3. Uh, he, he is flying. So if you cast Spectral Host on him, he does get to run and charge, which is a cool thing that he can do in Flesh Eaters that he can't do in any other army. And with only a nine inch move, um, that's that's not a lot. So if you add a, a command point for a six run, that's a 15 inch move followed by a charge. That's, yeah, he's fast. He's faster in, in Flesh Eaters than he would be in any other army. And his bonus revivability might bring back an extra flare or two throughout the game. But usually you're just wiping out flare units. Like they're not they're not durable, right? They're they're just gonna yeah. get wiped out, so. I'm the not... best use I can think of is giving a Terrorgeist with the, the Abhorred Ghoul King on Terrorgeist to four Abhorred in combat. That's it. Yeah, you cast a spell for Unholy Vitality and then you, you buff it to a four up in combat. Yeah. That's like the best combo I can think of. Maybe it, yeah, because I, I can't really think of anything else. It's so expensive though. Like that, so that's like yeah. three quarters of realist right there for those two models. And then you fill it with Battle yeah, Line like and you need your, your Arch sure. Regent. Just not feeling that yeah. at all. Mm -hmm. So if, if we're missing something, please let us know. I would really like to see Nagash be cool in Flesh Eater Courts. Not seeing it, though. Uh, overall, though, what are we thinking here about Nagash? Better? Worse? Uh, is this overall a buff? Overall a nerf? What, what are you guys thinking? James, what do you think? Uh, tough for me to say. Just a lot of interactions that you can do with Nagash. And I can't necessarily uh, wrap my head around it this early in right now mm -hmm. yeah it, it feels like in night Haunt he's he's good <laughs> i think that goes without saying um but every current use of him feels worse right like the soul blight lists that use him right now uh, are gonna have to pivot to using different stuff i think opr is the main reason main way people use nagash in tournaments and that build is a lot worse a lot worse well it was mainly because of allegiance abilities they were doing yeah. that like petrofex elite is just really strong and yeah now there's no reason for them to do that uh, even if they i think even if he had allegiance losing the reroll one that was the reroll save one that was so key for nagash losing that mm -hmm. is is like a death blow to him i don't i don't know how he recovers from that in obr specifically right yeah. but there's a lot more opportunities for him now in other facets so 
Arkan, I think, got worse. I think Nagash broke even, right? He's different. He's not better or worse. He's different. I, 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 yeah, I think that's a good way to put it. What I, what I like to say is, he got, he made the factions that were lacking or a bit in power a bit better, um, and the factions that are already sort of good on their own, where he was just broken, he's not so much of an auto take anymore. So like, mm-hmm. OBR are a good faction. Like, they have a good book. Um, I, I would say that the same of like Soulberg Glavelors. They just have a good book. And he's so he's not as good in those factions anymore. But in Night Hunt, which was kind of lacking because they basically don't have any good hammer units. Well, okay, now you have Nagash. So mm-hmm. and, and Nagash, unlike Arcan, is a good hammer. If only because of Arcane mm-hmm. Bolt, he is a good hammer. So high utility, good survivability, let's say. Not he's not unkillable by any means anymore. He can definitely die quickly and painfully. Mm-hmm. He's only 16 wounds, unlike a lot of other gods, which are 18 or 20. Yeah, I I, I can I like the new Nagash from from a from a perspective of somebody who plays a lot of different armies. I really I think I'm going to enjoy playing against Nagash more, and I think he's going to be more fun to use uh, for a lot of people because of his cool new abilities. So I'm looking forward to seeing more Nagash, especially in Night Hunt list, man. I've I've wanted Night Hunt to be good for such a long time. You're going to make me collect Night Hunt now, aren't you? Well, you have Nagash. It's like <laughs> half the army right there, man. Yep. Should have kept Soul Wars, man. <laughs> I, I I do have Ragnar. There you go. Oh, yeah, he's good. There you go. Let's see what the chat's saying about Just, Nagash uh, here. Get like three boxes of chain rasps and you're good to go. I have chain rasps too. You haven't chopped them oh, up no. into bits yet to use for your grand hammers? No, chain gas. I have chain gas, not oh, chain okay. rasps. Uh-uh. Let's see here. Uh, Noah says the council has decided Nagash is not poo poo. Too many interactions that they avoided with Arcan. He's not. I definitely agree. He is not poo poo. That's our sliding scale, like poo poo down here, and then like what's at the top, like based. <laughs> yeah. Um, buff for him actually doing things. Nerf for survivability, which is good. You shouldn't be able to throw him into combat with zero risk of dying. I agree with that. M rounds. He is riskier to use. He's no longer a sure thing that your opponent just can't kill. That you have to avoid all game long, and. Uh, but he does have a lot more utility now, which is great. Big, expensive models like this shouldn't just be stat blocks. They should have utility and unique aspects to them. They should change the way the game is played around them. I think Nagash is still a gatekeeper, though. Unlike Arcan, who I'm, I'm thinking is going to be knocked down from that, I think you still have to have a plan to kill Nagash. Yeah. Especially if you're a melee army. Um, Nagash still ruins melee armies. If you if you can't shoot Nagash, you're gonna have trouble. Oh yeah, because he can just sit there with those arcane bolts and just wait. Like, if you ever get anywhere within three inches of him, he's just gonna instant kill you at the start of the phase. Yep. Yeah, and he still basically dominates the magic phase unless you're out of unbind range with him. It's very hard to get spells off against him. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, let's move on. Talking about Kragnos. Uh, so, Kragnos is good. <laughs> Next segment. <laughs> no. Uh, yeah. So, his damage is exactly the same. His melee damage, his stats, uh, all that stuff is exactly the same. But he just got straight up buffed. He lost a couple abilities. Uh, you know, the most important one being the plus one bravery aura for destruction units. Super key. Like, I don't know how bone splitters are going to recover from that blow. I'm sure they'll find some tech. But without plus one bravery, instead, he he has some really good stuff. <laughs> so he ha- he counts as 30 models on objectives now, like a Gargant would, but it degrades as he takes damage, which is good, really good. That's a really good mechanic for the game to have, because when you have super big expensive models that count as 30 on an objective, uh, if you're doing, if they count as that many models until you kill him, uh, Damage is just meaningless, right? Like, you're better off just ignoring that objective. He just owns it. If you're not going to kill him, you just shouldn't do anything. Yeah. Uh, He also has a 6 The bracket's only, like, 18. Like, I think 18 at at its lowest, which Mm -hmm. is still really good. Still a lot, yeah. Yeah, Yeah. Yeah, like, AOS 3 is not about, like, we're not seeing those 90 Witch Elf lists anymore. I I don't really know, like, how many people have those kinds of, like, you know, more than 18 models on objectives, like, a lot of times. Mm -hmm. It's, It's rare. Yeah, I'm hoping we get back to it, frankly. 
I'm getting tired of this god mod god monster meta, but we'll see. Uh, so Kragnos also has a six up ward. So there were some rumors going around that he was going to have a five up ward, which would have been insane. Six up is no, fine. No, no it's fine. He's got a two up save. A six up ward is good enough, right? Like I, I don't want five up wards to be common in this game. So let's mm -hmm. it's good. Make him better in other ways. We don't need to just make him more defensive. Six up ward is fine. I would have uh, been okay if it was like a five up just against mortal wounds or something like. Like a worse version of, uh, I don't know, Morakan or something. Well, Arcan and Nagash both have four ups against mortals, um, but they don't have six ups wards in general. I think Arcan yeah. oh, yeah, can get yeah, them. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's fine. Yeah, yeah. Right. You know, half dozen of one, six to the other. It's they're they're comparable abilities. Um, he doesn't reroll charge rolls or hits if there's a dragon nearby. So I guess he's chilled out about dragons. Hopefully, the rest <laughs> of the community has as well. <laughs> Uh, he can't oh, be he can't be inst oh you finally got it okay he can't be insta killed uh, which is good because hand of dust on on him was you know he still could use his shield to block it but instant kill abilities feel really bad <laughs> feel really really yeah. bad uh, so it's good that some stuff ignores it so he just takes d6 mortals if he would be instant killed uh, but here's the best part and I saved it for last he has an 18 inch 3d6 charge aura for all destruction units wholly within 12 inches which is the most insane ability they ever could have given him just yeah awesome so my thing with kragnos i think uh, in our first live stream we talked about what we hope to see in, in this update i mentioned that all kragnos needed was more mobility like an extra if he could run in charge kragnos would be insane right because when kragnos charges it's the it's game changing it's like Night Haunt getting a 10 plus charge. It just changes the game if this guy gets a charge. And if he doesn't charge, if you just, you know, fight him normally, he can't retreat in charge. Like he's stuck there, right? Uh, but if he can get longer charges, more reliable charges, now we're talking. This guy's going to be insane. But they went one step further than that, and they made it an aura that works on every destruction unit only within 12 inches. Yeah, pretty, pretty good. <laughs> Without changing like, his points, he's still the same points he was before. He's now just insanely good. Good God. Yeah, which actually makes me think when they increased his points, like I want to say three months ago to 720, this is what they were already like had in mind, sort of, but they hadn't finalized it yet. Maybe, yeah. Maybe they were like halfway through redesigning it and they decided to to, to stick him with that. So who knows, yeah. man? We'll never know what goes on in that studio. But uh, man, this this enables so much stuff. Mm -hmm. It enables like ogres, like who are basically all about their charge impacts. Uh, it enables like gits, like just teleporting a bunch of gits into someone's face and having a three six charge. Spider riders, man, uh, that's uh, real yeah. now. <laughs> yeah. Just mortal oh, wound God. bombs. Oh yeah, because they deep strike, right? Yeah. No, no, you, deep you, strike? Yo. you can teleport them. They're a gits unit. Oh, okay. No, no I, I thought... I, I, don't, I don't know. Maybe I'm confused. I thought like a spider fang... There is a type teleport. of spider that can deep strike. I think it was tied to a battalion. But I think regular... Okay, okay, yeah. I haven't seen regular spider riders in so long, I, I could just be totally forgetting it. Do they even exist in 3rd yeah, yeah. edition? Do they have points? I, I don't remember. I haven't played against that faction in forever. But, uh, no, it's... Oh God, it's so good. And Gargants, like, mm -hmm. giving... Like, I'm not particularly afraid of, like, Gargant combat. Like, it's fine, but giving them that extra mobility like for a bunch of obsec models is oh, it's so good yep it's gonna be nuts man um yep. iron jaws teleporting into 3d6 charges like we talked about at the start of the stream gets teleported into 3d6 charges and and gets really needed a big tanky hammer unit like kragnos they get this is the best change for gets in in so many years this is better than their battle tome i think this is such a huge thing for them Mm -hmm. Ogor is doing mortal wounds based on the charge roll, so a stone horn basically gets an extra d6. It can run in charge, so you're, you're... <laughs> stone horns are going to be so yeah. stupid, right? You yeah. you can take uh, frost lord on thunder tusk and a stone horn, make enemies fight last if you're not charging, and just do a bazillion mortal wounds if you are charging, and then metal crunch for them. It's going to be so stupid, man. Yeah. It's going to be so dumb. yeah. They're just gonna delete things on the charge i don't think they've grasped the ramifications of this or maybe they think like those armies really need the boost 
Because even like mediocre units that otherwise aren't mo- like like imagine if retributors got this like stormcast retributors mm-hmm. or protectors they don't otherwise have mobility and suddenly you drop something down and give them three d six charge that would be so or, good yeah and that's what this is it's like so many destruction units don't have anything going for them like iron guts or brutes like uh, orc brutes you know all these foot sloggers that otherwise wouldn't get anywhere or don't get anywhere reliably and now they can it's mm-hmm. just so good this is a game changer like. This yeah. this blows open the meta completely. Kragnos is is here and he's here to kill the monster meta by being a, the monsteriest of all the meta. Oh yeah. He's like, so makes good. me glad Strongcast lists don't run that many monsters, because man, if you get pinned by that thing, you're dead. Yep. Now, a lot of people don't haven't played against Kragnos because he wasn't very good. So let me give you guys some quick tips. Uh tip one, always charge Kragnos first. If you can, get in melee with him and try to survive. Um, his only real weapon, I would say, is his mace, which is, you know, threes and threes and twos, rend three, but four twos damage. and threes now. It's twos and threes now. I think. Is it? I thought it was yeah. hits on threes, wounds on twos. Oh no, no, no! Sorry, six attacks, threes yeah. and twos, minus yeah. three, four damage. Yeah. That's a lot of damage, right? That's gonna wipe out most screens, most like reliably, easily, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so you can't just tie him down like you could with, for example, Archaon. You can't just throw five Vindictors with a couple save bonuses on him. You have to actually tie him down with something meaningful. Um, failing that, you have to stay the heck away from him. You just He's all about the charge. Shoot him before he charges. Uh, charge him first. Do not let Kragnos charge. Because that charge is devastating. Even, even when it's not charging monsters, 2 plus the deal D6 followed by a stomp can wipe out screens, or enough models in a screen at least, that he can then pile in and use his 3-inch attack to hit something that actually matters. Like, don't let Kragnos charge. That's the short version of how to counter him. We'll probably do a video about it. <laughs> yep. <laughs> oh, hey, Coach. Nice to see you in the chat there, buddy. Leave gets alone. They needed it. They did. And I'm glad they got it. This is great for them. I'm terrified what effect it's going to have with Ogres and Iron Jaws and Gargants, but I'm super happy that gets could actually be a relevant faction now. And, and more than that, I'm happy that Kragnos is actually, like, a proper god of destruction because ever since he was introduced they've been hyping him up in this way but it was really like he had a plus one bravery aura who cares like <laughs> that, i'm not excited well, that about necessary. that it was necessary though because uh you would hit your own guys with bellow of rage and then they would <laughs> flee so <laughs> it was to stop that <laughs> think of the synergy <laughs> yeah i know that was that was the synergy right there yeah, coach, you're right. It is hard to avoid 3d6 charges. Um, I don't think Kragnos can reroll natively. Can he do that now in his new War Scroll? I must have missed that. I think his reroll charge ability, you know, he can spend a command point, but I'm just wondering if he could do it in another way. I don't think so, but I could have missed it. Um, but yeah, I like that Kragnos is a proper destruction icon, and it feels like the way he's doing it is very character specific and correct because he's not he's not buffing them directly he's just making them matter and run harder right and that feels right like he's around all of these guys just want to fight more and that feels perfect for his character yeah mm-hmm. when they did the uh reveal during warhammer week whatever it was uh for kragnos in that trailer it definitely feels like that ending sequence there now like, you have those uh, Flood of Destruction armies just going through the trenches, and Kragnos just sort of, like, supporting them. Mm-hmm. Or... Yeah, it, it feels right. Um, so I got a positive question. Is Kragnos overpowered? I know this is way too soon to be asking that question, but at his price point, for how much he enables and how strong he is um, with everything combined, you know, he's a two-up save natively, He's basically immune to spells now with, uh, six, not basically, but he can't be instant killed. He's got a four, six up ward and he can 3d6 higher than the cast roll to, to ignore it completely. So he's got good defenses, mm-hmm. good offenses, good mobility, tons of utility, high model count on objectives. What's he missing? Like if you gave me these stats in any other army, I'd say like, that's insane for 700 points, right? Like c- compare him to like a Glotkin. He just, he does so much more than a Glotkin. Um, I'd say the only thing is, you know, he's not a utility piece in terms of, like, he is 720 points, he's not a wizard, uh, he has a 6 award, which is fine, it's it's whatever, 20% increase is fine, 
but he's still vulnerable to the mortal wound dealers that like sentinels and things in the game now his anti-spell utility is fantastic but i guess like against some higher spells he might feel that sometimes like that's the only thing i can think of but I... otherwise yeah he's just a beat stick and he lets other like he does what a god he, he ironically enough he doesn't get any allegiance abilities in destruction but like that's the only thing he needs the, the 3d6 aura for mm -hmm. everything around him yeah the six up ward is not significant protection against mortal wounds um it's not like a nagash and arcan having a four up so he can be killed with mortal wounds but that's a lot of mortal wounds you need on average 20 mortal wounds to kill him which is hard to do even for the list that do a bunch of mortal wounds now right so mm -hmm. i think he's going to survive that first turn even on the back foot and if you're if you're the aggressor if you get an early start with a battle regiment with this guy you're going to do a lot of damage and then they're going to be on the back foot you're going to take a lot of pieces off the board and i don't know if they're going to be able to come back from that so just yeah. make screening all that more important. Just screen the hell out of your guys. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Gore Grunters are going to have a field day with this. This is going to be nuts. Yeah. yeah. Going to be nuts. Anything that can move fast. Stonehorns, like you said. Yetis, like, I know Yetis don't see a lot of play, but run and charge on those guys in 3d6, like, ugh. Yetis run and charge? I thought they just piled in six. Um, they run and pile in. They run and pile in, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, oh, you're okay, Rich Barnes. You're right. Marathi does stop him. Marathi stops everything. That's that's not an argument. <laughs> like <laughs> it's like saying, oh, a card is bad in a card game because there's an instant destruction effect that you can play on. It's like, yeah, I mean, I guess Gotrek. Okay. Yeah, Gotrek and Marathi stop him. Um... <laughs> the fact that they nerf Unleash Hell also makes him so much more worse. Oh, sorry, yeah. it makes him so much better. Because Me that's another. Get on the yes. Yeah. That, that was one of the big counters to Kragnos before, was you would pepper him, weaken him, and then cripple him with an unleash, if not kill him outright, right? But now yeah. that unleash has to be within six, and you have less models within range. If you're in range to unleash hell, he's in range to pile in and smack you with his mace. Like, yeah. that strategy doesn't work against Kragnos anymore. It's done. It's over. Like, you have to yeah. kill him in your turn. Don't rely on unleash hell. Yeah, his the thing is like and okay like I don't feel so bad as a Stormcast player because I play Long Strike Raptors. Yeah. Um. Similarly, I can't imagine both Snake players with Marathi or Luminate players feel too bad about him. But like, what do you do if like if you're a purely melee army? Like, what do you do if you're dead? <laughs> like <laughs> tie him down with zombies like forever, <laughs> right? Yeah, I guess like because he's gonna chew through screens, monsters, anything that's in his way, and he's bringing a whole other army with him. <laughs> to to do just that like i feel bad for pure melee players that have to go up against this and whatever other destruction soup he brings with them yeah. I, I will say there's been a lot of units that i would consider overpowered in this game over the years and if if the way kragnos is overpowered turns out to be too strong right like the way that kragnos is doing things if that turns out to be too strong i i'm okay with it because it's it's cool and it's fun and it's thematic and appropriate for the character, right? If I'm going to have abilities mm. that are overpowered in this game, I don't want it to be like Luminous Sentinels and Foxes. I hate that kind of overpowered, right? Kragnos, yeah. you can charge him and kill him in that turn. He's not invulnerable yeah. like Nagash used to be. He is a... Mm. If he's overpowered, it's a good kind of overpowered. Something you can just tune with points here and there. Not something that just breaks the game fundamentally. So, not like horrors. like fun yeah. interactions with him. Yeah, I like that trade-off of... Hey, if he's gonna give a bunch of units that 3d6 aura, well, they better be ready to get some mortal wounds on him if he gets like chip damage by anything. Um, like I, I think of my annihilator list, right? And it's like, okay, I can thunderbolt volley him; he's gonna bellow. Then I drop annihilators; he's gonna bellow. Then I charge annihilators; he's gonna bellow. And then I fight with them; he's gonna bellow. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, if you can do damage in every phase, you're gonna look good against Kragnos for sure. Yeah, yeah. It, it definitely raises the value of uh spells that like arcane bolt in the movement Not phase spells, prayers prayers are good chain lightning is good yeah. um if you cast arcane bolt is while you're in melee your... yeah why not it's mortal wounds you can bellow oh yeah that's true 3d6 and if he rolls above a six he ignores it <laughs> yeah that's pretty likely to ignore i always forget about that for some reason yeah it's really really good yeah coach i'm looking forward to that matchup too i was actually thinking uh Kragnos, like this horde of charging dudes from 3d6 up against a, a wall of nurgle and like seeing who wins that matchup would that just sounds like an awesome battle i really want to see it play oh, yeah. out 
and disease tokens. Like, like Lot can Kragnos hard counters game. Kragnos, I think. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Because they got Lenska, yeah. Actually, no, Glacken doesn't because he can charge from 12 inches away, like exactly 12 away. And then. Well, Glocken no, no, no. can't so do that. Because Glacken can only target something that's within 12. Yeah, you, you'd charge, have to. Kragnos can do 3d6. You'd have to charge outside of 12, but that's also pretty unlikely. Even on 3d6, I think the average on 3d6 is 11. So like a 12 is, mm -hmm. is starting to get up into that range where you're like, yeah, I don't know if this is going to reliably happen. There's room to play around it, yeah. which is good. That's a good thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Overall, Kragnos, no question, he's way better, right? You can't just, yeah. like, we, we kind of waffled on our count and the gash. We're not sure what's going to happen, but Kragnos is strictly better. And he's so much mm -hmm. better in such a specific way. He's He's going to change the meta. For sure. I think he's most impactful for Gargans. I think he, he not, uh, now that he's going to see a lot more play, it knocks them down a peg, and it makes them have to change their list from four megas to Kragnos and two, two of something else. And it makes that list, by definition, a little bit weaker. Kragnos is only 18 wins. It, it does weaken the list um, in, in the sense that it's no longer hyper-focused, but it pivots mm -hmm. it in a new direction, which I think is overall better. Being okay. hyper focused is not necessarily the right thing to do in this game because if you have a hard counter matchup, you just lose, right? Mm -hmm. Like if you're a slow melee army, you lose to shooting, straight up. Uh, if yeah. you are a, a fast army but you're fragile, you lose to any army that can screen and wall, right? The hard counters exist. Versatility is key in Age of Sigmar. Yeah. On the topic of Gargants. Let's go into the core rule changes. Uh, so big one, I would say the biggest one is the Amulet of Destiny being a six up ward. Uh, that is huge. And I don't think anybody is complaining and I don't think anybody is surprised. This, this artifact, since day one, people knew this was too good. We didn't need to have elaborate math conversations about effective health and how much stronger it is than a six up ward. We didn't need to do this. It, you could just tell one game with the Amulet of Destiny, you're like, yeah, this is dumb. Why does this exist? Uh, giving any hero a five up board is just way too powerful for a generic artifact. And uh, this is the ripple effect of this is monsters are just going to be easier to take down. This isn't going to have a big impact on foot heroes. Foot heroes generally didn't get that much value from a five up board, right? Like you have to start creeping up into the eight wound range to have a big impact from this. Uh, like mm -hmm. Gardas, for example, we all use Gardas. He just dies sometimes. Even with a 5 of board, he just dies. It's not that good unless you have a lot of wounds, right? Mm -hmm. It That's, scaled really badly. That's the problem. It's, and, it's, and it's a dice game, right? You need a lot of dice yeah. rolls to get a nice average in order to get a good bell, distri or bell curve distribution of your, of your effect. And when you only have six wounds and you're rolling five ups to save that, it's not enough dice rolls, you know? It can swing really high or really low. Um, but stuff like Maw Crushes, that's way easier to kill. Uh, Star Drakes... Gargants, the Toralon, all these kinds of hero monsters that would take this are just so much easier to kill now, which mm -hmm. pushes us further into a shooting-based meta. And uh, I, you know, we're going to talk about this later when we talk about points, but the points for shooting units did not change significantly enough. So this is a really, really good change. It seems really small, but it's going to have ripple effects throughout the whole metagame. When you combine this and Kragnos, I think the era of you know 18 wound maw crushes with the amulet of destiny that's over that's not the meta anymore we're past that mm -hmm. and also it makes arcane tome the best artifact in the game right like yeah <laughs> at least for us at least for storm guest it's it's definitely the best artifact in the game yep um, so i mean I, i'd make a case for like mirror shield but sure yeah uh, six up ward is also another, another reason a six up is so much worse than a five, not just in terms of like raw numbers. So many armies already have six up wards, right? Hammers of Sigmar, death. Like this is just useless for death now. Who cares? Yeah. Um, so many armies have other ways to get six up wards. Five up wards were rare and hard to get or cost a lot of points. So just, yep. Rest in peace. Amulet of Destiny, I will not miss you. I hope we never yep. see an, an artifact this strong in the game again. Chase, I'll agree that the 5 of board was helping mitigate the shooting meta, uh, but I'd rather mitigate that with like something like a generic mirror shield. You know, once per game, this hero can't be shot. I'd be, I'd much rather have that than a, all the time throughout the game of 5 of board. I think there's other ways to to push a, a shooting, anti-shooting meta. 
Yeah, because five up doesn't just ward shooting though. It war it like completely wards melee too. Mm -hmm. If you're trying to kill a gargan in melee combat, like for a lot of armies, that's not happening. You're not getting effective. You're not causing fifty two wounds to that thing, and that's the average what you need. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Morgonka, I liked your. I, I wish we went, they went with your idea from our first live stream, bringing back Ignax's scales, making it a four plus ward against mortal wounds. I think yeah. that would have been really good change and also really good for the game in general. Because uh, yeah. mortal wound spam, it's it's always on the rise and it's always like teetering on the brink where we're one battle tome away from going into a mortal wound spam meta. And uh, I mean, we sort of already are. I mean, kind of. people hate draconic flame stream. You know, yeah. if they printed Ignatius scales like four up, five up, like would that have been as problematic? Maybe not. The drakes could probably go back down if if there was a generic four yeah. up ward against mortals. Yeah, drakes are suddenly yeah. not nearly as scary. So. That's a good idea. Yeah, they, I wish they went with that, but um, they didn't, unfortunately. It, it is what it is, yeah. yeah. Now, if they're going to change enhancements, general enhancements that are in the core rulebook, I would rather they make them weaker than make them stronger, because it opens up room for battle tomes to do the unique stuff that's actually fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Agree. I'm going to use the washroom real quick. You guys want to take some uh, chat comments? Sure. Yeah, Chase, I, I'd say, um, yeah, I think the Star Drake is the one that's the hit the most by these changes. Um, and the changes to, uh, I think, Drake Scale Armor, like it being, a, uh, the reroll is not applying to random damage weapons. I think Star Drakes do get hit a bit, but honestly, I, Star Drake is not a model that I'd see, like, considering much tournament play outside of maybe casual play. Um, so I, I guess I'm okay with it. Uh, but you know the Star Drake can still take good artifacts. Like Drake Scale Armor is still good. There's not a lot of weapons out there that are random damage, and most of them are like two, three. Those are the ones you're worried about. Um, and you can still take you know a mirror shield on it. Uh, it's it, it's fine. I I don't think it's too big a nerf. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I think the Draconis would definitely can. Uh, yeah, mirror shield on a relic instead of amulet on Draconis. Honestly, Draconis. He's, he's such an aggressive hero, yeah. The amulet was almost an auto take on him, but now I guess I could go for an arcane tome for flaming weapon on him. Um, you know, bump up his damage on that sword, turn him into a Galmaraz wielding guy. Uh, thoughts on the clarification that Drake skill is not to be used for random? I, I don't know why they do this. I feel like. <laughs> it's honestly wouldn't even be that broken, but I, I guess they just like, it reminds me of the time when they got asked, um, does the final ward apply to um, Hagnar taking more wounds or just wounds? And it, it ended up being just wounds and not more wounds. I feel like they quickly think of this like, oh no, it'd be too strong. Just, and they don't like really fully think about it. So it's whatever. There's gotta be two different teams, right? There's gotta be like the team that writes yeah. the rules and then the team that does the FAQ stuff because there's like quicker answers. They just want to make sure they clarify things. They're not trying to write new rules. And that's uh, and, that, and sometimes I would assume maybe it's intentional or maybe it's a mistake. They will uh, write Necrolith, a rule. I don't think so. Uh, because the, um, I think the normal troll run can still take traits and a mount trait. So scintillating, the, the two I really want to mention is Master of Magic and Scintillating Trail, which subtracts one from um, uh, Unbinding Worlds for all enemy wizards for your spells. So, I mean, Aventus is good because he has two spells and he has a healing built in, but you are giving up those things for that, so just keep that in mind. Uh, Aventus is really good when you want a second spell on your list, and you don't always need it, because sometimes, like, there's three spells we care about, right? Uh, Thundershock, Mystic Shield, Celestial Blades. So if you have mm -hmm. a Torallon and two other wizards, you've got your three spells covered. So Aventus, in that case, what would his second spell be? Right? He, he You'd have to take, like, Chain Lightning or Lightning Blast. Like, it's really marginal. Um, and then he has to cast Mystic Shield every turn, or a King Bolt, which, again, very marginal. You can do some cool stuff. Like, you can charge into a Stomp, into an Arcane Bolt. Like, that's a lot of upfront damage, potentially. But it's really marginal. So... If you're using Aventus, it's because you generally have no other wizards or just one other wizard, like an Arcane Tome Relictor, usually. Um, Aventus is good, uh, it's, for sure. Let's talk about Unleash Hell. Yeah. So yeah, that's a big change today. Yeah. yeah. So Unleash Hell uh, used to be, if you finish a charge within nine inches of a unit, you got to shoot with the whole unit. Now the charging unit has to finish within six inches 
and only models within six inches can shoot, which is a huge change for the damage output's the same, right? If you get all your models in range, you still do the same amount of damage that hasn't changed. But using Unleash Hell is much harder, it's much riskier, and I'm fine with that, risk and reward, right? So before you would just like one model nine inches away and the whole unit of long strikes or judicators got to shoot. Now you basically have to put them in melee range in order to reliably get all of them to shoot, which is way riskier. It's way scarier, right? You don't want long strikes ever taking damage from any source. So if you're doing that, yeah, <laughs> it's just spooky. <laughs> I don't think I would. I think I would just stop. I think I would just stop relying on Unleash Hell, which is overall a good thing for the game. More damage output from shooting units is not what the game needed. So agree. higher risk shooting is what the game needs, right? If, if, sh if shooting is going to be strong, it needs to be risky. It can't be safe. Safe long-range shooting is bad. It's a bad design. Uh, Timothy asks, how are strikes still using Blades, Halo, and Chain Lightning? No, I've actually updated the list in our Discord. Um, Azure 8 Halo was definitely a bad pick. Um, we thought it was going to be more impactful. It's not. Unfortunately, there's just not that many save rolls happening. We're not doing a lot of high volume attacking right now. If uh, if Blight Kings take off, like if Nurgle is really popular, then it could be. Uh, it could do a lot of mortal wounds against horrors and things like that. But in general, we're still facing off against high damage, high rend, low volume attacks. So Azure and Halo is not very good. Uh, Hallow Strike is primarily using Chain Lightning, Celestial Blades, and Mystic Shield. It's casting those three spells pretty much every turn. Chain Lightning's good. If you don't cast Chain Lightning, you cast Arcane Bolt or, or Thundershock or something like that. So. I like Chain Lightning personally because I like tactics. Sometimes it's like that last little point of damage in the hero phase you need. Um, it can trigger Bellowing Roar sometimes, maybe. I, don't, I, I like it still. Um, I like it less than when I first picked it, but I, I still like it on the Toralon. Uh, so yeah, uh, another big impact from this Unleash Hell thing is the fact that models have to be within six inches, which makes big block shooting units way harder to use. Sentinels, Judicators, Stalkers, any any shooting unit that was like a double reinforced battle line something or other, that's way harder to unleash with, which means it's a lot safer to charge that stuff, which means they need a lot more screens in the way and they have to play further back. Right, because if these if these units typically get charged, they're going to get wiped out. Anything that wants to charge them is going to be enough to kill them. Um, is this enough to kill prosecutors, though, Morgonk? I think you and I were talking about this. What, what's what's no. your take on this? Uh, sorry. Uh, so <laughs> I think yes. Um, my main concern with prosecutors was having to directly charge a shooting. So. Okay, so the only okay, the only reason I put prosecutors on my list was because of sentinels. I was afraid of charging, you know, techless or something that that would near nine where it would just automatically trigger. And prosecutors were a great way for me to tie down a group of sentinels. But now there's just so much area where you can land on eye and charge them and not be within six of like the whole unit. You know, maybe only like four or five models. And like, yeah, sure, I'll eat an unleash shell. I don't care. It's not that bad. Um, it's Are, more problematic if you're charging like the center of the whole unit. But yeah, but you're always going to charge on a flank somewhere, right? You're going to yeah, find the weak I'm flank. A, yeah, I'm going to charge a flank, or I'm going to try a charge where I charge something else and then pile into the sentinels if I have to. And that was the big problem with Unleash Shell that you could, you know, it, it it could be done so safely where even if you charge like a screen, they would trigger it. But now it can't. It's not a, it's not a screen protector anymore. So even against things like storm fiends or um, uh, daughters of Cain bow snakes, yeah, sure. I'll just I, I don't think prosecutors are as necessary anymore. Do you think they're it's, so good? Losing one grand hammer is a big deal, right? Like it all it only takes three mortal wounds, and you can do that with only a couple models. I I still think prosecutors are worthwhile if you're running grand hammers, and not just because of these big block units, but like there's still other things in the game that shoot unleash hell just as well. Six long strikes more or less unaffected by this change. Um, Dracoth's unaffected, Storm Drake's unaffected. Lots of stuff has shooting that you still want to avoid, especially with 80 point per model Grand Hammers, right? Like losing one of those is huge. That's potentially uh, nine damage that you're missing out on in melee, and sometimes that's the nine damage you need to like push the next level of Battle Shock or finish off a monster, especially in squads of three. Yeah. Like using a losing a third of your unit on an Unleash just to a bad dice roll. I think I think prosecutors are sticking around to keep that 
from happening as well. 12 damage with Unleashed, I hatred. That's true. 12 right. damage with Unleashed, yeah. If you're a true yeah, Chad I, and I you have a, a Draconith nearby. <laughs> um, I don't know. I, I feel like I want to try at least some list without it because not only did because most of these units, not only did they take a point hike, but they also got this has unleashed held nerf. So they have to be a lot more careful about placing their little tight little castle. Um, because previously they didn't. Previously it was just, oh, did I end up vaguely within nine? Okay, I'm going to shoot you with my whole unit. But now with their positioning have to be, has to be much more tight. And I don't think those like really tight unleash held dependent castles are possible anymore. Um, so I want it for a bit. I'm going to try it without prosecutors, and then you know, if if it turns out that it's just as strong as ever, then sure, I'd I I'd be happy to be wrong about that because that list is tight on points. Mm -hmm. Like anything we can yeah. shave off there to get more utility, more screens, more support heroes, anything really would be good. More shooting even would be good. Yeah, yeah. agree. Yeah. yeah, this doesn't kill only shell. It's still good. It's just. It's not as good as it was before, and the abuse cases. I think this helps clean up those pretty nicely. Like nobody's really, they're not making this change because Dracoths are breathing four times when you charge them. Like that's a fine use of a command point that people expect. That it's not out of bounds or anything. Um, there's bigger problems for them to tackle. I think this is a good change overall. I mean, having to worry about six six inches of every model makes positioning really good. Like you, if I lay all my uh, drakes really wide apart like sideways well suddenly i can't unleash hell as effectively anymore yeah you know same goes with storm feeds they're on two ranks on these huge bases if you charge like an angle of a screen somewhere they can't unleash hell with all their uh, flame cannons or whatever it's yep. pretty good yeah i like it i like it a lot um makes the game harder to play <laughs> that's a downside yeah. i would say but eh, that's probably fine it's already a hard mechanic to use whatever uh heroic recovery two main changes one uh, the hero has to be more than three inches away from any enemies. I think that's great. That's brilliant. Um, it's, you know, it sucks for us because we use a lot of tanky heroes like Star Drake, uh, Bastion, Yandrasta, Krondis. Sometimes less than Prime can benefit from it. So that sucks. But it's a good change for the game overall. It makes our shooting better, which makes Stormcast better. Right? Because if we shoot something and then charge into it and then... Uh, like any shooting damage we do that we then follow up on is more meaningful because they can't just heal from it freely if we leave them uh, unattended. So happy about this change. Uh, and when it does heal, it always heals D3. So no more of this one healing if you roll your bravery or D3. Uh, I wish it would just... Do we need a bravery check on this? Just make it heal D3 all the time. Like why do we punish destruction and, and beasts of chaos for no reason? Just... Make it heal D3 all the time. I don't, I don't know. Make it heal one, and then you do a bravery check to make it heal an extra one or something. Like, it just, just feels... Just make it D3. Just it's make it D3. Yeah. I don't, yeah. I don't know why they don't. Some, some, I guess it's a dice game. People gotta roll dice. They just hate Beasts of Chaos, man. They... <laughs> Which is a shame. Yeah, yeah, good change overall. There's not much to say about that one. Um... Another nerf to Star Drakes, unfortunately. Yep. And let's get into Stormcast specifically. Uh, so here's the the big changes that hit Stormcast. Uh, Drake skill armor confirmed terrible. It is the worst possible interpretation that could have been. Turns out to be what it is. Still not consistent with the way the rules are written, but at least we can stop arguing about it. So that's good. Yep. <laughs> it, it's fine. I, I don't. I don't really care about that artifact anyway. Mm -hmm. so it, it, if you want to use it casually, fine. If you want to take it out for a spin, okay, cool. I'm not too concerned about it. Yeah. I. You know, there could be a point where it becomes useful because it seems like we're getting rid of a lot of D3, D6 damage profiles, and a lot of the stuff we're worried about has flat damage. Kragnos, flat damage four, right? Rerolling yeah. saves against Kragnos actually could be good. So the only thing this could really affect is like the Durthu and Nagash, who have like random damage. Now. Yeah, it's it's useless against Nagash. <laughs> but yeah. if you're in melee with Nagash, you're not worried about the D6 sword. You're worried about the 8D3 mortal wounds. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Holy commands received an errata to clarify just what the heck they are and how they work. Uh, it works exactly the way we predicted it works. Um, it's weird that they had to errata this because. Yeah, at least in my understanding, as written, it worked fine. 
it's good. No more arguing. You take one holy command. You can only use it once per game. You can take another one if you get an enhancement. Can't be the same one. Clean, easy, right? No yep. more arguing. No but more that's... banking six call for aids. Yeah. yeah. No. Uh, Please. Thankfully, but that's just two of a list of like thirty plus questions that we needed answered. So, props for them to answer two questions. But there's still a lot more to go. Would be nice to figure out how any of Bastion's abilities actually work. That would be a nice mm -hmm. thing. Uh, sure would be nice to know if missing keywords are intentional, if the Drake Sworn Templar is supposed to have a 4 or a 3 up save. A lot of, a lot of unknowns in our book. Would be nice mm -hmm. to get clarification on them. Um, specifically, I want to mention the Amulet of Destiny. Uh, that's, that hurts Star Drakes and Torlon. Um, because yeah. even if you had a Gardas 5 up ward, or even if you had Hammers of Sigmar or 6 up ward, there were times where you still wanted this, this tanky, flying fast monster off on its own, doing its own thing. And you just can't have that anymore. You have to keep like a really tight castle with Gardas, or you just have to accept that your vulnerable monsters are going to go out there. So another I think nerf. I'm, I think I'm Drake. okay. I think I'm okay with that. I think I'm okay with just giving the Drake scale armor. Like, I think you'll be fine. I think worrying about mortal wounds. I think you can build a Star Drake with enough healing, and uh, just a Drake scale armor to be worth it. I, I, like a five award. Yeah, it made him really tanky, but I'd rather not sacrifice the game's health for that. Yeah, no, it's better long term and overall for sure. Yeah, I, I'm. If that's the hit we got to take, fine. Star Drake has taken much more beatings than that. <laughs> he's just, yeah. he's like the whipping boy for Stormcast. Like any bad change that hits the game, Star Drake first one in line. Like I got this, bros. I'll take it for the team. Yep. Uh, but aside from that, we got no nerfs that we didn't know about. Like the Drakes, like we're good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're fine. Yep. No changes to fulm fulminators. No changes to raptors. Guardus actually went down. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're great guard. War scrolls didn't change. Um, I can't think of what to spend those ten points on, but it's beautiful. Triumph. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Sometimes we get a triumph. Yeah. Yes. Sometimes you don't want to cast celestial blades because they have an agash. Sometimes you just want to go okay plus one wound. Yep. So, I'm stoked. I've been excited about this all day. I was dreading the winter FAQ because I was I was totally convinced we were going to see nerfs to long strikes and fulminators. We didn't, and I think enough time will pass by the next one that we probably won't again in spring. So, great, <laughs> we did it, boys. Yeah, I I really didn't want this to be a knee jerk reaction like for sequiturs and evocators where they like nerf them by twenty points and then later realize oh this wasn't necessary six months later. Yes. But the fact that they didn't go with it means it gives them more time to realize that it's not broken. Like it's good. But things are allowed to be good. Yes, exactly. And, uh, you know, maybe three months from now, people will realize that Storm Drake Guard aren't actually worth 340 points. Maybe, you know, maybe 300 was okay. Maybe the Knight Draconis doesn't need to be 300. So there's room for hope. Yes. It's beautiful. <laughs> um, yeah. But on the other side, we didn't really get any buffs either. We have a lot of bad units, uh, overpriced heroes, overpriced units. Uh, you know, given the circumstances, I'm not going to complain too much about that. It sucks that Dracolines are sitting on my shelf for the three more months at least. Um, yeah. There's also That's no. Fine. It gives me three yeah. months to paint my Vanquishers and Vigilors and, and the Night Relictor, which is our next painting competition. <laughs> is it? <laughs> the, yeah, the Night. Isn't it the Night Relictor? The Relictor, yeah, yeah. But not Vanquishers. I thought you were yeah, talking yeah. about Vanquishers, yeah. No, no, no. I, I, Vanquishers, Vigilors, and the Night Relictors. That's what I got I mine. Yeah, yeah, I just got mine today. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, no change to the Living City command ability, which... Okay, I don't... Maybe they just didn't mine. know about it, man, but that that is stupid. The thing is not... Yeah, people don't play that much Living Cities. That's the thing. In they will. In common data especially, like, yeah, they will. Like, when they realize how powerful it is, like... Celestial so Hurricanums with Frostheart Phoenixes and four Fulminators. Oh, man. Yeah, yeah. Um, at a local tournament in my area, Carl from Season of War was there. A lot of the Season of War guys were there, which is fun to see them. Uh, Carl was running uh, Living City with Iron Drakes, four Fulminators. I think he had two squads of Fulminators. I, I don't remember his exact mm -hmm. list, but yeah, he was running that that combo. And like, it's just so gross. Like, you yeah. can't stop like, them oh, from game. charging. Oh yeah, because Translocated move move got shut down, but not not for them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> just... I was certain this would have been flagged immediately. Uh, we got to stop talking about this stuff. That's that's the problem. Is the more we talk about it, the more likely it is they're going to nerf it. So 
just mm, that's it no more next topic <laughs> next topic yeah Krondis um, should know all the spells yeah Marathi and Ilarial, they know all the spells why doesn't Krondis Croak knows all his spells why doesn't Krondis apparently dragons are wise but not that wise no they're, they're just like no one spell I'm good yeah I guess because he gets a really good War Scroll spell, maybe that's how they justify it. But then, I, I, I don't know, Marat, yeah. I guess maybe that's how they justify it. Because his War Scroll spell is really good. Like, I get their gods, right? They they are literal gods. But Krondus is so close. He's the, the model size, the, the regal nature. He's got all this cool stuff going on. Maybe in an errata. Maybe three months from now we'll, we'll get that change. Yeah, we'll have to see. Yeah. Would be nice. Let's check in with the chat here. Yeah, Jace beat me to the punch. Uh, I was going to respond to Mediocre Insight and in saying that we're headed towards the Neep meta. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Neep Stonk's on the rise, boys. This is it. This is the time we've been waiting for. I hope you guys have five Neve Black Talons ready to go. There's no stop in this train. It's it's Ogre. Yeah, like so many people want to run Gabriel Sherhart. Let's, let's drop that boy. There's okay. so much they could do with him. There's so much design yeah. space they could have to work with. They just chose to do why nothing. Didn't, why didn't, yeah, like, Jesus, why didn't, like, oh my god, I think of the Kragdos 3D6, I'm like, would Gabriel's 9-inch deep strike plus 3 to charge really have been that broken? <laughs> on Fulminators? Yeah. <laughs> oh, come on, no, I don't even you, think so. You'd have to do something like, silly, like, restrict it to just Retributors, right? Oh, yeah, just restrict it to strong cast models with 3 or less. Make him, like, an Imperitant, but for Chargers. There we go. Yeah, you could do that. Grand Hammers already have a delivery mechanism, so it's pretty much just uh, well, Evocators. There you go. The Evocator build is back. Yeah, like, it's fine. It's fine. Evocators aren't they're... great. So uh, uh, when I see this like mobility option for Kragnus, I'm like, oh, come on. Do the Heralder and Gav really need to go down? And the answer is no. Hmm. Maybe we'll see more mobility for us in the spring update. One can hope. Maybe anything is possible now. This the way they've done this update has given me hope that they can actually make good changes for this game. I was like yes. way too cynical before this update. I, I was convinced it was just we were all well, track and there's no changing it. Yeah, especially after the last errata like that was just uncalled for, frankly. Yeah. This feels like you know, I've have I've had this ongoing theory that they have the rules team than the FAQ team. This feels more like the proper rules team sat down and, and thought of these changes. Yes, definitely. If this These is aren't like knee-jerk changes or just removals. These are like slight tweaks to very mechanical tweaks, mm -hmm. almost like someone thought about them. Yep. And if they're an accident, so, then they're a brilliant accident. This is a good good FAQ overall. What are we talking about next, Paul? Um, so I might have to log off. So cool, can y'all continue the stream without me? I think we can and, manage. <laughs> okay, Have a good night, buddy. Yeah, you too. All right, so we are going to talk about noteworthy point changes. So these, th there's a lot of point changes. Like I said at the start of the stream, most of them are irrelevant. Not many people are going to care if like Wrathmongers are ten points cheaper. Like when is that? When is that going to make an impact on the game, right? But there's a few models in here that are worth talking about. So for Stormcast, it's definitely Aventus going down by 15. That's noteworthy, right? The difference between a regular Torlon and Aventus is now so little, and it's easier to squeeze an Aventus into lists that you otherwise wouldn't have been able to. Um, I don't know how big of an impact it's going to be because the Torlon, like we said, still has all the traits and stuff. It's fine. It's good. You know. Um, same thing with Gardas. He's down 10 points. The lists that we're using him don't need those 10 points. So... I don't know. I, I don't think this has made any difference, either of these changes, really, for, for what Stormcast are doing. Uh, Nick Riley says, the entire Discord chat was a pillar of salt for the past month, so it's hilarious, but good to see this was such a subtle touch. Yeah, man. Yeah. We <laughs> are we ready to close the salt mines now? Or? Oh, no, they're ever burning. There's, we will let never that, run let out the, of salt. Let the salt flow through the streets of the Stormkeep. If, if we don't have a salt mine... It will just be everywhere on the server. It, it is like a containment thread. Or that, that's all it is. Yep. Uh, Chase says, I dabble in corn mortals. 
Individually, changes were not much. Collectively, it shaved 80 points from my corn list. Uh, that was 1965 already. It added up. It does. But how relevant is that list to the, the greater tournament meta, right? Like, I don't see Blades of Corn all of a sudden, especially without Archaeon, just coming on the scene with hordes and hordes of one-inch range, 40-millimeter base <laughs> infantry. Like, these changes are not big enough, and it almost feels like they had to change something for every faction. So, like, perfect example. Fire Slayers got the tiniest point changes on heroes nobody cares about. That's not going to impact any list. Fire Slayers are still not... They're going to be exactly the same place they were before. Arguably worse, because in a Kragnos meta, slow melee armies are just looking real bad. Right? Like you're going to get charged, you're going to get smoten, smited? Smitten? Smote. Smote. You, you will... Ye shall be smote. Um... <laughs> Uh, yeah, the streets will run white with the salt of Stormcast players. We shall never simmer. We shall never forgive. That sounds cool. That sounds like a part of the mortal realms where they have like salt deserts. You know, I want that. I feel like that's going to be the Stormkeep like motto now. <laughs> We're gonna <laughs> just. Oh man, this is not good branding. <laughs> Okay, uh, Bastilla. As a Seraphon player, I'm I'm keeping up with the changes to to Seraphon pretty closely. Um, right after I finished analyzing Stormcast, I jumped into Seraphon, and the Bastilla going up by 15, Salamanders going up by 20, and right down there at the bottom, Gotrek went up by 50. Those are big changes. Um, a lot of Seraphon lists were using Gotrek because he was a durable hammer that that's something that stormcast current or sorry seraphon currently lack um he was a nice utility piece that could just hold a flank all on his own and if you, you know if you ever get near godric you're just dead so the the plan with him was to avoid him and that amount of denial of space is very very good for seraphon who are an otherwise uh i would say low damage output army like if you're not spamming salamanders seraphon don't do crazy high damage like they're not like fulminators and long strikes levels of damage so they were relying on Godric to be that part of their list. And a 50-point bump to that, alongside a 15-point bump to Bastilodons and a 20 on Salamanders, this really adds up. This has cut a big chunk of a lot of lists. Um, they're probably going to have to lose some, maybe one of the smaller support heroes. Like if your list was running two Skink Priests, you might have to drop one of them now. The Salamander spam lists are pretty much unchanged. You lose one Salamander squad, maybe, right? Instead of running uh, eight, you run seven. Not that big of a deal, right? It's like the it's like when they changed um, storm drakes for stormcast, right? All that did was make like the the all dragon list is pretty much the same. You lose like one or two units, you lose a unit of drakes or draconis or something, but they're just much harder to fit into mixed lists now. So, yeah. Uh, Neko in the chat. It says Aventus points changes means I can fit him into a full Dracoth stack with Vexilor and Celestin on Dracoth. Yeah, man, that's the list we were talking about earlier today. I I want to see how that performs. It looks cool. It's it's very uh very different from how we normally make lists. Like this is just tons and tons of MSU Dracoths and then a bunch of buffing heroes. So I want to see how that performs. The Salt Keep. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Tim Anderson, I thought you guys were going to have at least another couple videos in the bag. New tier list and list video, but nope. Uh, yeah, man, it's only been 12 hours since the FAQ came out, so need a bit more time. <laughs> Plus, we're going into Christmas. Yeah, holidays. holiday season starting. Um, we're definitely going to put out a new tier list video. We're definitely going to put out a new Lords of the Storm. Uh, I've already started writing up the slides for both of those, so it won't take that long. It's going to be good. Thankfully, there's not that many changes. The tier list video is pretty, uh, pretty straightforward. Yep. Uh, so what else? So changed? let's talk about Lumineth and the Sentinels, the big one that everybody likes to talk about. Yeah. So Sentinels are still going to do the same damage they did before. They're still going to ignore line of sight. Uh, their Unleashed Hell is weaker, which is very good uh, from a tournament meta perspective. Their positioning is much worse, and their damage output on Unleashed Hell is much worse. 
but that's not really the main reason people were worried about Sentinels. Like people were already playing around their Unleash by throwing disposable units of Prosecutors or Aether Wings or Vampire Bats and things like that. Unleash Hell was not the reason Lumineth were good, right? So a small point bump to Sentinels doesn't do much. Like it's going to affect the list that use 50 to 60 Sentinels. Those are definitely going to take a big point increase. But if you're just the typical kind of Lumineth list, which is using a squad of 30, that's not the biggest deal in the world. 60 point bump doesn't change the damage output of Sentinels. All it does is reduce the other things in your list. So you might have to downgrade a hero. You might have to cut a hero. Uh, maybe you don't run tech list and you run some other support pieces instead. Maybe the pivot will be to the Lumineth Fox list, which I just despise playing against ever so much. Um, Overall, not a not the hugest change in the world, right? Like specific matchups will change. The Unleash Hell thing is definitely an important one for Stormcast because of the way we charge in with small units on a flank from Deep Strike. That's definitely a, a good change for that matchup. But in most cases, Unleash Hell was not probably probably not what was going to win you the game. Like if you got to the Lumineth Castle and you survived against you know, a round of combat, you're probably going to get shot the next turn anyway. I'm not a Lumineth player. I don't know how all their matchups go, so I don't know how impactful it will be for them. I can say from a, a Stormcast and Seraphon standpoint, it's not the hugest change, right? Oh, Tim's saying, no, 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 I meant there were no changes. Yeah, I mean, basically no changes to anything, uh, which is a good thing, right? Like, it's... It's a good thing that we don't have massive changes because all the lists that I was writing between November and today are all valid. Don't have to worry about changing anything, which is which is cool. Um, Daniel says, Lambent Light needs to be a 6 to 8 inch spell that the Wardens have to do for them. Like they're lighting up the target for their paired archers since they come in pairs. Huh. Now, would you be able to do that instead of Empower or in addition to their Empower? Lambent Light, yeah, it, it's crazy strong. Being able to re-roll and fish for, for fives and sixes is is nuts. Um, there's a lot of things they could do with Sentinels. 20-point increase in Unleash Hell is not going to kill them. They are still going to be a huge threat in the metagame. If, you, if your list can't deal with 30 Sentinel Lumineth lists, it's not good enough for GTs, straight up. Or you're just, you're just hoping to get good matchups, I guess, right? Like That's a strategy. <laughs> just rolling the dice. <laughs> Uh, similarly, Bloodstalkers only went up by 10. Now, Bloodstalkers are interesting because, I don't know, you guys in the chat tell me, but most most of the time when I faced a Marathi Bloodstalker double tap list, it also had Gotrick, right? I, I feel like that's the standard way to play that list, but you guys let me know otherwise. If, if that's, that list is definitely hurting, right? An extra 30 points on Bloodstalkers and 50 points on Gotrick, that cuts out something significant in that list because that list was already really tight. So we'll see how that turns out. But Bloodstalker's going up by 10 just... And at the same time, Marathi can cast any spell from her lore all the time. Not impressed. <laughs> That's not a significant change. Especially now that the Amulet of Destiny is nerfed and Gargants are vulnerable to shooting like they've never been before. Gonna be interesting to see just how strong this stuff gets. Uh, Noblars and Gluttons took small little drops here and there. Noblars going from 120 to 100 is bigger than it seems, because instead of paying uh, 360 points for a, a whole bunch of models, I think it's like 20 per squad. I wish I knew the unit size. I'm pretty sure it's 20 per squad. But yeah, you just get a whole bunch of models for not a lot of points right now, and that's one thing Ogars have been missing badly. Efficient wounds and bodies, like screens that they can just stretch out. So a 20-point drop on Noblarch doesn't seem like much, but I, I think this is going to have big changes to Ogre list. People are going to approach it differently. Gotrix seem popular from what I've heard, but DOK players in my area don't run them. Okay. Doesn't rely on Gotrix, but Marathi is a big issue, not the Snakes, that dang ability. Yeah, Marathi's definitely a tough cookie to crack. Um... I kind of like the idea that there's something in the game that you just can't kill in one turn, no matter how much damage you have. I like that from a uh, like list building perspective. Like you can't just have a meta where everything, every single thing dies to Thunderbolt Volley. That would just be boring. I'll see you later, Modnar. Have a good night, buddy. 
5 a.m. seems reasonable. Why why are Europeans staying up to watch our stream? I don't like cool. <laughs> I appreciate it. But man, get some sleep, guys. Sleep heavy, drink a lot of water. Like yeah. <laughs> uh Gorgrentas are plus twenty. You think that's enough, James? <laughs> uh I don't think so. 170 points for Luminet Sentinels, 170 points for Gorgrentas, and 170 points for Blissbarb Archers from Slanesh. Slanesh. One of these things is not like the other. <laughs> One of these things does not belong. <laughs> Just. Yeah. 170 for Gorgrentas still feels too low. My That's my initial impression. Um, but Iron Jaw has taken a hit on the Maw Crusher with the Amulet of Destiny. That that's a you know one two punch. That's a big hit to that army, right? Can't just spam as yeah. many uh, Gorgruntas as you could before. And having your big centerpiece that supports all of them be vulnerable uh, means you might even start running a second centerpiece, which is really really expensive. So yeah, yeah. A lot of these point changes. Um are more so critical of like a secondary rule ch uh, change or tweak that happened in the errata as well. So. They definitely, yeah, I got that impression that they, they're not, they're holistic, right? They're not just yeah. scalpel. We're going to make this one change to this one unit and hope it happens. I think they've, they've considered, uh, considered the whole picture. Yeah. Uh, Matthew Kelly in the chat says over here in Australia, Godric and Marathi are the go-to combo. Yeah, that's, that's what I'm seeing too. Anytime I see Marathi with bow snakes, it tends to also have Gotrick there because they're like this double anvil approach is what you need in order to cover both flanks, right? If they want to come down through the middle, that's great because then you just close the trap in on them and Gotrick has a field day. Uh, but being able to protect two flanks is super important for that list. So that, that seems to be why uh, Gotrick is, is so, so crucial. We stay up for the same reason we donate. Your content is great and worth being up for. Thanks, man. And, and then a little dabbing emoji too. That's that's just perfect. <laughs> I'm glad. Thanks a lot, buddy. I'm glad people like our content. I was really worried when we started this that like nobody would care. <laughs> well, I, I think the thing that we have going for us right now, and quite frankly, you alluded to it uh, before we started the stream, Paul, is that we built that Discord, and the Discord is really big, really big part of our community at the end of the day, right? I love it. I love wasting yeah. hours of my day on that Discord, just talking to people. It's it's such a good community. Just talking to all these guys is great. Everyone's friendly. Yeah. Like, there's so few arguments. We barely moderate it, but everybody's respectful and friendly. It's it, it's fun. It's great. Okay, horrors plus thirty five. That is good. <laughs> Horrors are the worst thing in this game. Just the worst unit in the game. I hate them. Uh, going up by 35 doesn't seem like much, especially because some armies can just summon them. Disciples and Legion of First Prince can just summon horrors, so there's no change. There's no change in how effective the unit is. But what the difference between starting the game with 30 horrors or 20 horrors, or in, you know, if they want to get really, really expensive, like just reducing the amount you start the game with is a big, big deal for both Zinch and for Legion of the First Prince. Um, Zinch in particular, losing their mega kill bot Archaeon is a huge deal. And now they're also taking another hit with the nerf to Horrors. Zinch is going to really struggle after this. They have weight, like they're going to pivot off Archaeon, I think, and just go mass Horrors. And this nerf is here ready, waiting for that to happen, right? So this is a really good change for the game, and I'm totally biased because I hate horrors and I hate playing against them. Um, I don't know if this is enough to really nerf Legion of the First Prince. Legion is going to pivot. They're probably going to start using Plague Bearers, uh, but that's a much easier matchup. Like the thing Legion, if you guys have seen our video about how to counter Bellicor and Legion, the thing Legion is really weak to is Alpha Strikes. If somebody hits them first before they can get settled and start summoning more dudes because they don't start with a lot of stuff. So if you can hit them first, you're going to do great. And starting the board with less horrors is really, really bad for them. Now, they might pivot off horrors entirely and go with Plague Bearers in order to shore up that weakness. And in that case, 
you know, you don't have to deal with horrors throughout the game. Like dealing with 30 horrors at the start of the game or dealing with, you know, 10 is huge. It's a huge difference. That matchup gets a lot easier. So good change overall. I would prefer if they just got a new war scroll, but take what I can get. I'm still going to get 100 plus uh, horrors in the new year and paint them. <laughs> Contrast paint. And yeah, why not? Uh, catching up on chat here. Matt says, I started AOS this year focused on chaos, and you dudes turned into a turned me into a Stormcast primary. Happy to help. Put you on the right path, man. <laughs> uh, Noah says, the Stormkeep makes the Stormcast community feel more connected. It does. Yeah, I, I really like the Discord. I, I, I don't want to gush too much about it, but it's been it's been really fun. Um it's good to have a refuge from everything else that's happening outside of the internet right now. Been very helpful. Yes. Uh, Noah asks, horrors versus Severeth, which do you hate more? That's a tough one. That is a tough one. Um Yes. Horrors. You can shoot Severeth easily. He just dies. If you point a gun at him, he dies. Horrors, you need a lot of guns. You need more guns than most lists can bring to bear, and you have to do it every single turn. So if I had to pick one, I'd pick Horrors. Yeah. Uh, Jay says, the, yeah, the keep rocks. Very glad to have a one-stop shop for focused content. I read and watch some other stuff for wider POV, but only play Stormcast now, so this is home. It does feel very homely. That's a, that's not a, that's not the right word. That's that's a bad word. Homely it means ugly, right? Home like. This it does feel very home like. So it's it's good. <laughs> Thanks, man. Um, Neckerth says one of my biggest fears getting into Warhammer was being shunned a bit for being green as grass. This Discord has helped so much just to learn the basics well enough to play in clubs. Yeah, I was I was really shocked at um I I got the impression when you first started talking with that you were a much more experienced player. And uh it's been it's been interesting to watch you grasp the game from from a distance, right? Because I I kind of taught James how to play the game and watching him learn the, the intricacies of it has been really rewarding. So it's been interesting to also watch somebody, you know, through the screen also experience that. Definitely rewarding as well. Um, Nick says, Plague Bearers are weaker now unless in Magikin. Weaker is... No. <laughs> Unfortunately, no. I think Plague Bearers are actually better now than they were before. They're two wounds apiece. They have you know basically no armor save. They only get a 5-up ward if they're Magikin, but they get a 6-up ward in Legion and a 5-up ward while they're standing near a general. So... Yeah, Plague Bearers are a good pivot, uh, especially two wounds apiece for 150 points. Still give access to a 5-up board, minus 1 to hit by missile weapons. They are still good, definitely. Yeah. Echo Papa asks, when do we get a Seraph Keep Discord? I was thinking of picking up that army. I have to assume you're asking about Seraphon, right? Uh, I've been thinking about it. Yeah, maybe um, we'll see when they get a new battle tome. That might be the time to to add on to our little community here, uh, expand it out to another faction. I, I'm thinking if we do it, it would probably be... Cities of Sigmar seems like the obvious extension. I don't know if there is a, a Cities of Sigmar community out there like we have for the Stormkeep. Um, I know that there is a Seraphon one. It's called Lustria Online. They're really great, and I love talking to those guys. Um, I don't know if there's one for Cities. So, Also, I don't know what I'd call this stuff. The Stormkeep is such a, a fitting name. I really like fun thematically appropriate things like that i don't know what i would lizard call. as per jace lizard person spacecraft lizard person spacecraft okay sure uh meep mop the content is well edited and organized with informative slides and s helps my awful attention span scan through prior to the storm keep my go-to was goon hammer faction focus articles thanks man appreciate that um yeah the the I picked a format for this podcast that was going to be easy for us to do and mostly like about the information, right? Really 
low on the style and technical aptitude of things and just pile on information on top of information. Um, so I'm glad it's been it's been helpful. Uh, Goonhammer, is there like do people not have a problem with Goonhammer? I, I rather like their focus articles. They're not as in depth as what we do here, but uh, for like a top top down low resolution view, they seem good. So they are what they are, right? They can't be. You can't have a storm keep for every faction on one place, right? People have different interests, and the game's way there's too much stuff going on. Like you can't yeah. have a person understand this much i'm strained understanding like two factions of this game to any serious detail so i can't even imagine anybody trying to do that you'd have to have like a full dedicated team right minimum yeah. like one person per faction going into the level of detail that we go into here you'd have to have that for every single faction and that's too much to ask probably i mean if you could find some way to monetize that that would be amazing <laughs> i don't think there's that much it's just not that much money in this community, right? Like, this is all passion driven. Uh, Matt P, I believe we do have uh, the tier lists and breakdowns as PDFs somewhere in our Discord right now. We if have not, then... we have an image pinned in the Ask Questions channel, I believe. Let me double check that real quick. Uh, Goonhammer is a good intro, yeah, but some of their opinions are questionable. Uh, everybody has questionable opinions, man. I, like, I'm not, we're, we're not perfect. You know, people have uh, differences with our opinions here, especially about rules. <laughs> people have a lot of, a lot of opinions about how we view rules. Uh, yes, the tier list summary is currently pinned in the Ask Questions channel on our Discord. Uh, that's, and I'll be updating that as we go along. Maybe it would be good to have just a dedicated tier list channel. Maybe. We'll see about that. Yeah. Uh, so back uh, to unit changes mm -hmm. here. I think yeah. we left off the Chaos War Shrine and Source of the Lord. Yeah, so, so these are kind of interesting in the context of what they did with Archaeon. Um, Chaos War Shrine going up 30 points and Source of the Lord going up 20 points are pretty big hits. Like th these lists, um, these are great support pieces. Source of the Lord has an amazing spell. Chaos War Shrine has all kinds of utility. And they were so good that people were... were slamming like two war shrines into a list sometimes i'm not well versed enough with slaves to darkness to know how big of an impact this will have on them it does impact them as coalition units they like they can't benefit from allegiance um like war shrines even if they get the right mark they don't get you know meg it can of nurgle keyword for example so they're they're going to be weaker individually that's not going to impact their actual role in those armies, though, because Magikin of Nurgle are still Nurgle units at the end of the day. So if you bring a Nurgle Chaos Shrine, it's still going to do the exact same effect it did before, just 30 points more. So these are these don't seem like huge changes. I don't think Chaos War Shrines were so good that people were using two of them in Zinj or two of them in Heed Knights. So it's, it's a minor nerf, especially because a lot of these armies uh, got point cost reductions. This pretty much offsets it. So... I don't see these as being very big changes aside from specifically being run in multiples or alongside an expensive piece like Archaeon. Those lists got weaker. I don't know if they needed to, frankly. I don't I don't see Slaves to Darkness uh, like tearing up tournaments right now, so I don't know if these nerfs are warranted. Um, I wanted to I wanted to highlight some Slanesh points and kind of use this as a jumping off point for a conversation. Slanesh has awful points, right? Like their rules are are at a point where they need way more than this. Like dropping 15 points off off their hammer units, painbringers, and twin souls, like hammer relative, right? Um, that's a good change, but it doesn't. I don't think it goes far enough. And the problem with Slanesh isn't the points necessarily; it's the rules. Like their units just are not impactful enough. They they don't do enough damage. They don't have any kind of durability, and these point changes don't change that. Um, you recently had a game against Slanesh, right? Were, were they using these units? Like, uh, I think he was using Painbringer. Twin Souls, he didn't use, no. Now, yeah, no, it, if he had 20 ahead. more points to spend, or, or 15 more if he had Painbringers, would that have changed the outcome of that game? Absolutely not. Like I would, In both games that I played against him, I was... Uh, deleting his models uh, fast uh, off the table faster than he could really do anything about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Sl Slanesh needs help. You know, you see every now and then a list go four one or five zero with a really good player behind it who's 
doing phenomenal things, getting good matchups, I'm sure, and getting a good roll of the dice. But yeah, Slanesh, like Matt is saying in the chat, Slanesh needs new War Scrolls, man. Their damage is really low. The it's a situation that Stormcasts were in in Second Edition, where the the rules are bad, and the old, and if you try to balance it with points, all you're going to end up with is a horde army, and to me, Slanesh doesn't seem like a horde army, right? You don't want to face like 60 pain bringers. That just doesn't look right. You know, they're they're an elite unit. So Yeah. May, I could see maybe like those um what would you call them? Like the Egyptian looking uh bliss barb archers, all that's Egyptian's not really the right word, like Persian. Persian. The uh Persian looking guys, that would make a cool horde army because it's like they don't look strong. They look like humans, basically, like just basic humans. Oh, here's the big thing I noticed about Slanesh, and uh, both uh, Kyle and myself noticed this, is that they are super easy to just get a unit wiped out, which makes their whole uh, depravity point system moot point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the game is too lethal on both ends, right? Yeah. If Slanesh charges something, they're going to pr try to wipe it out. Because if you leave stuff alive, like what are you doing? <laughs> You're trying to kill stuff yeah. so you can take territory so you can conquer the objectives you're trying to prevent them from using rally and teleporting away and recovering like an ability that relies on not killing things in age of sigmar is a bad ability it has to be yes. really really powerful um so maybe what they could do is pivot slanesh and lean harder on the summoning but after like you weren't around for the second edition of slanesh summoning but man it was gross it was so gross so I don't think they're going to repeat that anytime soon. Um, yeah. Unfortunate. Uh, yeah. Gotrick went up 50 points. We talked about that. I think he's going to be... Yeah, that's what I wanted. 50 might be too much, frankly. I was thinking 30 to 40 is what he needed, but I, I want to see the end of Gotrick as a standard anvil hammer in any list that can use... any army that can use him, because... The problem with him is that he's so good at what he does that he becomes a replacement for weaknesses in your army, right? Daughters of Cain, one of their um, weaknesses has always been that they don't have durable units. They can't take a hit, but except for Marathi, right? And Marathi is costed, I would say, fairly based on her role as this unkillable anvil unit. But then you add a second one into that army, and you're like, oh, okay, so hold on. This army of, like, loincloth witches is suddenly super durable and I'm having all this trouble punching through their front line. Like what is happening here? And Seraphon, same issue. Um, they, they are not like Gotrek just fills a hole that is, that is missing from these armies. And I don't like that as, as a generic thing. It would, it's like the amulet of destiny being a five up ward is too strong of an effect for, for plugging holes in armies. Like iron jaw shouldn't be a mega durable army. Amulet of Destiny makes them feel more durable than they need to be. And Gotrick is the same thing for older armies that are missing this kind of thing. So I'm happy he got nerfed, partially because now I don't even have to consider painting him. I, I don't see myself using him. He's been on my backlog forever. I and mean, he could stay there for a while. <laughs> uh, Noah says, Gotrick should be 800 points for the sin of his Skaven base not being legal and matched play. I like the way you think. I do like the way you think. Yeah, his Skaven base is so sick. All that detail and and like the more dead rats you put on a base, objectively the better the model becomes. We need a Night Questor or some Liberator or something just killing Skaven. Just like a whole pile of them. He's got his Grand Hammer and just swing it into him. That's what we need for the next Collector's Edition model. Just another Questor, huh? <laughs> Always. Thunderstrike Questor this time. <laughs> uh, so let's talk about what is missing from this FAQ because we covered what's in it, we've given our opinions on it, and let's let's have a discussion of what is missing from it. In our opinions, of course. Um, so the first thing is the Demon Prince of Corn and his ability Blood Slick Ground is a really sore spot for me. Um, I don't like this ability, even if you don't play it as an aura as i typically argue for uh it's still an incredibly powerful ability being able to half run rolls and and charge roll is nuts 
this this guy's especially because it's from 18 inches away like this guy stops the Kragnos meta right 3d6 charge halved no way you're you're not getting into melee with this guy um this is such a a strange ability because it's not worded as an aura but it seems to be everybody uses it as an aura and it's so powerful that like and it's really hard to understand the interaction with, with what is and isn't an aura so it's like that perfect mix of of hard to understand and incredibly powerful that makes for a frustrating experience so i would have really liked to see them clarify this ability if not outright just completely errata it it would have been nice at least to know if it was an aura or not an aura um, but the range on it's huge 18 inches is it's too much <laughs> like this ability is so strong um maybe maybe legion of the prince just isn't on their radar you know maybe they're not thinking about it Another one is is kind of in the same vein. He fits into Legion lists, but Kairos Fate Weaver seems just really, really, really good. Like Zinch uses him really well. Legion uses him really well. Um, being able to do a guaranteed six mortal wounds at his top bracket to anything within range, very reliable spell casting and Oracle of Eternity shutting down one thing per turn or guaranteeing one thing per turn, really strong. And it just it could be an issue like Gotrick where you just need to increase his points a little bit. I don't think there's anything in his war scroll that you can necessarily hit that would make him unusable in any way. I'd rather see a point increase. Just make him more costly. I think that might be the way to go with Kairos. Have you had a chance to play against Legion? No, you haven't yet, right? No. Get some chance though. Have you played against Kairos in general, like in a Zinch army? No. 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 He's uh he's an annoying one. Yeah. Uh we definitely Kairos. Go ahead. He's on my radar for next year. <laughs> oh, good. Good. Well, we could feature him on the channel at least. All right. We can. Uh, yeah. <laughs> maybe I'll convince Bart to get an Iron Jaws army too. We can put that in a in a video. Uh, okay. We need more Stormcast rule clarifications. Oh God, do we ever need more? Um, in the meantime, feel free to check out our Storm Fact channel. It sounds like a swear. Storm FAQ channel. Uh, we try to put answers, consensus-based answers in, in there. Uh, I think I added one today. I'm going to add another one probably about the Toralon. I think I've been waiting for a lot of these questions to not get answered in the FAQ, I guess. Um, but we'll have to form our own answers and, and kind of create a community consensus until Games Workshop comes out and says otherwise. So sure would have been nice to know uh, how Bastion works. Uh, another thing missing is, like we talked about, point drops for a lot of overcosted Stormcast units. Pretty much every Sacrosanct unit feels overcosted. Vanguard units feel overcosted. Uh, most of our heroes are overcosted. Uh, Vanquishers and Vigilors, like the new stuff, is overcosted, which is a real bummer because they're gorgeous models. And I hate hate telling people that they just shouldn't use them in, in competitive tournament lists because they're just inefficient. That sucks, man. Yeah. Yeah, you want to put them under the Christmas tree for some people, you know? Well, you opened it already. No. I just had a good idea. <laughs> uh, let's see here. Um, Chase says, Iron Jaws should be durable. It's in their name. Mm, I guess, yeah. Uh, they are the Black Orc successors. However, if they are durable, killy and fast, they should be appropriate, pointed appropriately high. Yeah, I have no issue with that. Like... If you are very fast, very durable, and very strong, you should cost a lot of points, right? That makes sense. And I would be okay with Iron Jaws if they went in that direction. Um, but it seems like there's a certain vision that they have for how many models Iron Jaws should be putting out. And those models need to be of an appropriate strength in order to get to a certain point value to fit that vision, right? So Maw Crushers feel like they should be around 500 points. If they don't do enough, then they're going to feel bad. Then you're going to have to keep lowering their points until they're 350 or, or 300. And then at that point, you're like, well, look at how big this thing is. 300 doesn't feel right for it. So I want Iron Jaws to be impactful. I want them to be cool and fun. Super durable seems to be not something that they should have access to, right? If they're going to be fast, they shouldn't be durable because I want them to be punchy, right? They've got these huge weapons. They look like they should be doing a lot of damage. Their armor looks heavier than Cruel Boys and Bone Splitters, but like, the comparison there is like actual armor versus whatever rags they found <laughs> like 
it's not a real comparison. Like Iron Jaws look durable. Like anything looks durable compared to Cruel Boys and Bone Splitters. So, yeah. If they, if they if you have to pick one thing that Iron Jaws should not be, it should not be durable, right? They should be more durable than others. But if they have to be fast and punchy, then durability should they shouldn't be durable as well. And I think their current durability is fine. Four up saves across the board is fine. I just don't want them having good ward saves on top of that. Uh, Meat Mop says the one corn player we have has the corn demon prince. He kind of needs it with how bad corn are. Yeah, for sure. Corn blades of corn. Blades of corn uses this model really well, right? Um, but it's a situation where the faction is so bad, so it's okay to have overpowered models, like. I don't like that argument because then you get stuff like uh, like Aether Wings in second edition. Like, did anybody enjoy playing against Aether Wings in second edition? Well, it's okay. Stormcast were bad, right? Like, this ab this ability just it's not good. It's not fun to play with. It's not fun to play against. So I'd rather I'd rather them remove these kinds of abilities, and at least the game becomes more enjoyable, and they can stop balancing it around these broken abilities. Got to rip off the bandaid, I guess, is what I'm saying. Uh, the Steel Yard says Legion of the First Prince was hit by re heroic recovery. Yeah, I could see that. They're they're a melee tar pit army. They want to survive as long as possible. Especially Bellacor not being able to heal in melee is a pretty significant nerf to him. I think the horror change is a bigger deal, for sure. If they end up pivoting and going plague bear spam, and then summoning horrors, overall that's an easier matchup. Right? Like you won't win round one, you'd have to win like round two, three, but that's probably fine for the game overall. Legion is a really problematic army. Um, it's warping the meta in bad ways. You have to play around in a very specific way, and you have to tailor your list uh, at least somewhat in order to beat Legion. The inner machinations of Bastion's War Scroll are an enigma. Yes. <laughs> Every ability seems like it works, but there's questions. Lots of questions. All right, what else is missing? Um, I really want them to get rid of the D6 Mortal Wounds from Draconid. I, I yeah, think, we, allude, we alluded to that earlier. Yeah, I would love it if they changed it to just deal D3 all the time. Or if they need to have some kind of spike, make it deal three mortal wounds. On, on, if you breathe and you roll a six, it deals three mortal wounds, right? Not a five or six, just a six. And not a second dice roll, just a three. Nice and simple. Flattens the curve, reduces the maximum amount. It's great. That, that would be much better. And then we could take a look at lowering their points back to something reasonable so that you could use them and not you know, still have screens somewhere in your list. Uh, Lumineth Sentinels still ignore line of sight, and that still feels awful. It just feels awful to play against. Um, tactically, they're the most versatile unit in the game. They're super hard to kill. They do a ton of damage, and they just ignore all line of sight while they do both of these things. Um, just, it, it's like, if I had to pick one thing to change about Sentinel rules, it's the fact that they ignore line of sight. That's the one thing I would definitely change. Because how do you, like, you play around it by shooting them, but they shoot better and longer range and I don't know. So one that's the thing I would change. Fox says moving in the enemy shooting phase. This is not as big of a deal yet because people have not changed to spamming foxes, but I, I gotta tell you guys, it's coming. It is definitely coming. There is the, the power of Lumineth Foxes and their movement shenanigans can't be ignored forever. It will eventually come up and it's 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 going to make the game miserable. I would rather change this sooner than later. And Gargants, we saw almost no direct changes to Gargants. We saw, if anything, an interesting new direction for them to pivot their list and take Kragnos and, and be more aggressive and actually fight you properly. Um, the problem right now with Gargants, as far as I can tell, is that their ability to count as 30 models on an objective combined with their ability to just move objectives around makes them an army that doesn't want to fight you. They just want to kick objectives and retreat over and over and over 
and uh, basically put the enemy on a, on a clock. Like, if you can't kill me in four in the first three rounds, I'm just going to win by points, and there's nothing you can do about it. So you better have the ability to kill you know three or four gargants in that time, or you're just going to fall too far behind. And that doesn't that doesn't make sense. <laughs> like, look, look at this guy I have in the corner here, a giant monster. And his and he just wants to retreat over and over and over until they somehow just win. I don't get it. So there's a big uh, big disconnect between what Gargans should be doing and what they are doing. And I really hoped that they would have addressed it, but maybe it's a bigger change than what is allowed for a small update like this. Maybe we have to wait for a general's handbook or even a new battle tome. This might just be how Gargans are until they get a new book. Would be very unfortunate. And lastly, did Marathi really need to get buffed right now? <laughs> like, there's nothing wrong with Marathi. She's in every Daughters of Cain list. Like her points didn't change. Why do we need to make her stronger? I, it's it's fine. It's I like it from a character perspective. I really like that. But in terms of power, did was this necessary? <laughs> Could we not have just waited on this until a future update, maybe? I don't know. It's a weird one. Jay says, that's why I don't want the bracketing obsec. I'll take my ball and go home. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm torn on, on the idea. I, I want to see how it plays out with Kragnos. Uh, it's good in theory, but I feel like it doesn't address the root cause of the issue, which is that you can't out fight them for objectives and as long as that's the case then they don't care about fighting right even if you degrade down to 18 that's still way more models than what your opponent is typically putting on there it needs to go down to like five or one even like it has to be a significant enough downgrade that doing damage to them actually matters because then the gargants will actually care about offense themselves because if the gargants can kill enough of your stuff so that you can't hurt them back then they don't have to do this weird dance anymore. They can actually be an aggressive army. But right now, it's a situation where I, I have one wound left and I'm still 30 models, so retreat. Cool. Great game. Doesn't feel right. Um, kick, kick distance needs to go down. Kicker, gar ugh. Kicker Gargant should be immobilized post-kicking. Total kick number limited and mightier needs to bracket. Yeah, I think the kick thing is so cool. It's such a cool ability. But it feels like it needs limitations. Um, once per turn would be good. Like, regardless of how many Gargans can kick, only one of them can do it. That would be a good first starting point. Because I really don't want to get to a point where, where they're walking around and kicking three objectives every turn. Definitely don't want that. So um, let's do a quick winners and losers, right? This could be fun. Uh, we'll go back and forth, and we will each pick a winner, and we'll each pick a loser. And then uh, we'll do two each, and then let's have the chat pick number five for each one. How about that? All right, uh, winners. Cragnos, uh, right? Cragnos is the first 100%. winner. 100%, number 100%. one, most improved model without a doubt is going to be Cragnos, right? Um, how about you? You got to pick a winner now. If I had to pick a winner, yeah. Uh, first slot, I agree with you. It's Cragnos. Are we going to second slot right yeah, now? Yeah, yeah, second, yeah, yeah. Uh, Stormcast. Just Stormcast in general. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> By just standing in place, not doing anything, we. We take a slot there. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I can't believe we, we came out of this unscathed. That's unbelievable. So that's a big win. Not not getting nerfed is the best thing that could have happened to us. Truly. And we came out 10 points cheaper. <laughs> <laughs> can't believe that. Uh, yeah, if you guys in chat want to start telling us your winners, we'll take a look at them as we get to number five. Um, if I had to pick another winner... I was going to say long strikes. I was hoping you'd say fulminators. Um, it's 
It's got Marathi is such a winner, right? Like everything else gets weaker, she gets stronger. Her list, if you're if you're just going like without Godric, her list barely changes. Um, I'm gonna put Marathi in the winner category on this. I I think it's it's contentious because the list that uses the double bow snakes and Godric is gonna be weaker, but Marathi definitely got stronger. So that list might get weaker. Daughters of Cain might get stronger overall. The utility of having every spell available, not knowing, like, a big thing about the anti-magic unbinding meta that you have to think about is you don't know what spell your opponent's going to cast and you don't know what he's going to target. So if you yep. know every single spell, you you don't know what your opponent's going to do, right? That's a lot of value in that. Um, whereas if you know your opponent's only going to cast, let's say, Mystic Shield, and you're like, oh, okay, well, I don't have to worry about whether I need to make a decision or not. Like, it gives more tactical versatility, and I like that a lot. So, Marathi, number three, winner. <laughs> Back to you. What do you think's number four? Number four? Uh, I was going to say Nagash initially, but I'm going to follow what Jace is saying here and say Night Haunt. Ooh. Yeah, Night Haunt. This isn't like an ordered ranking. This is just things we think are. Night Haunt's looking good. Night Haunt's looking yeah. real good. I am looking forward to that. <laughs> it's I've I've wanted Night Haunt to be a good army since they were introduced in second edition because they have some of the best models they've ever made for this game. From a technical standpoint and in like aesthetic, I really like them, but um just what they've done with all the different flight stands that they have, like with their ghostly parts hanging off the bases, they're a phenomenal looking army. And it's such a tragedy that instead of that being like the standard death army that people use, we got like ghouls from 10 years ago and then skeletons from 10 years ago like i really expansions want... for a game that was discontinued and then re renewed <laughs> yeah yeah welcome back curse city yeah. all right let's see here winners winners we got to pick one from the chat what are you thinking here the real winners are the friends we made along the way says me pop me pop okay yeah the stormkeep discord is the fifth winner <laughs> Uh, I mean, we mentioned Stormcast, so we can't pick Aventus and Gardas for spot five, right? Um, Legion? I'm not sure if Legion are a winner. Pink Horrors are nerfed. Heroic Recovery is nerfed. Destruction as a Grand Alliance, actually, yeah. I think, Seems to I, be a good one. Yeah, I think Kragnos covers it, though. Right? Yeah, I guess, yeah. Hmm. Let's put Destruction down, right? Kragnos himself is just so good. Like, he's a big winner, and then Destruction as a whole are just... I think it's such a significant change that we could put him as two different spots on this whatever list that we're making. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. Let's go with Losers, then. And I'll let you start first. What do you think is one of the Losers out of this uh, big update? Uh... Well, he's falling from grace. Uh, it's going to be Arky. Mm. Arky is definitely a loser. If I had to pick, yeah. Um, yeah, definitely a loser. And then, you know, as collateral damage, he's taking down a lot of stuff with him. Right? Disciples of Zinch is much worse off. Blades of Corn is much worse off. Yeah, that's a big one for sure. Lump that all together as Arky. Uh, I'm going to say number two is going to be Seraphon for me. They're definitely losers in this. Um, the double tap Bastilodon got more expensive. Uh, Godric got more expensive, so the lists that we're using him are going to be even tighter than they were before. Salamanders are more expensive. These little things really do add up. And I think that's... If you're using three squads of Salamanders, you're 60 points down. If you're using three squads and a Bastilodon, you're uh, 75 points down. And that's pretty much a support hero right there. So that's that's enough, I think, to, to qualify Seraphon as a loser. Um... On the other hand, you know, Gargants are easier to kill, so Seraphon are looking better in that respect. Though Stormcast got no nerfs, which is one of the hardest matchups for Seraphon right now. Yeah, Seraphon are a loser. I'm going to put him down there, number two. Fair enough. Um, number three for me is going to be Gargants. The loss to Amulet Destiny, somewhat significant for them. Uh, and at the same time, Kragnos is 
going to be changing up the meta, so they have to plan around that now. Yeah, yeah, Kragnos is such a huge hit to the Gargant meta, because every time he charges, he has the potential to just kill one. It's insane. Truly insane. Yeah. And then losing the amulet is big. Uh, um, we'll, we'll have to see how they pivot from that. Number four, I'm going to put as the Star Drake. I know we, we said Stormcaster winners, but the Star Drake, man, just keeps taking a hit. He just can't catch a break. It's it's so sad. <laughs> I feel bad for him, man. Yep. Uh, and and number five, I'm going to agree with Noah from the chat here. Gotrek is... The Drakes. Or, the, you think or, the Drakes? Oh, yeah, you're agreeing with yeah, the God Trek is a loser. You're right. Yeah. I was going to say uh, Storm Drakes are an honorable mention because they've been just taking nerfs since before the FAQ, or the FAQ came out. So, mm -hmm. See, I'm, I'm not even... Their point increase I'm not even putting as part of the data scroll or battle scroll, whatever we're calling this thing. Uh, I would put that as something that happened before this even came out. We've, we've been used to it for four to six weeks now, however long it's been. I'm not... Like, I'm not phased by it. I'm not even including it as part of this this update. Um because it happened before the models were out. So can you call it as part of this update, really? Yeah. I think it's a pretty fair winners and losers list. There's not too many things directly impacted by this because the point changes weren't that huge across the board. There weren't significant rule changes. Um, yeah, it's open for more, but there's always the next one. That's the good thing about these updates. We get them every three months. If they're gonna be like this impactful every three months and then a big one in the summer, I'm on board with that. That seems cool. Doesn't yeah, invalidate your purchases. Up. Yeah, man. I'm, I'm looking forward to this. Yeah, light it up with the general sandbook or something like that. Yeah, big shifts. Uh, get a new realm, get new priorities, get all kinds of stuff. Small changes throughout the year just to tide us over, make sure nothing is too broken at any point. And yeah, I'm okay with it. Good job, Games Workshop. Might be the last, first and last time I ever say this. I <laughs> uh, hope not. Okay. That's it. We covered everything. It only took us three hours. We did it. <laughs> Every time I think we're going to go for like an hour or two hours, it always goes way over. I have no idea how long this stuff takes to talk about. I... Well, live streaming is a different beast, right? So That's true. You get to read the chat and interact with these guys, which is a lot more fun. Uh, so, upcoming episodes, if you guys are paying attention, um, we've got episodes coming up, Stormcast Units and Cities of Sigmar. I was waiting until the FAQ dropped to see if there would be any significant rule changes to things like Hallow Heart or Living City or Hammer Hall. Nope, no changes. So that video is going on ahead. We will probably sit down to record that sometime next week, and we will try to get it out before the new year. That's the goal, I hope. With the holidays coming up, who knows? It's tough to fit anything in there. Uh, similarly, we're going to be doing an updated tier list just to cross T's, dot I's, that kind of thing. I don't see very many units changing from our October list because almost nothing has changed since then. Um, so that won't be that monumental, but still worth talking about. Uh, Lords of the Storm number three, that's our list building series. Lots of words there. Uh, list building series, the... We're going to open up submissions for this on December 26th because we do every time we do one of these, we always have the people on Discord post lists and then everybody votes on the lists and the ones that get the most votes get featured on our videos. So this time, the theme is that your list has to have either Krondis or Karazai. Could have both, but it has to have at least one of those. And I personally will go through every single list and upvote the Krondis list because I want to see Krondis work. So give me your best Krondis list. I want to see what you guys come up with in this. So that'll be December 26th. It'll be open until probably sometime after the new year. I haven't decided yet. Depends on when we get around to filming. And uh, take us through Hobby Hangouts, James. Yeah, so we uh, three times a week affair that we have on the Discord. Uh, basically just come have, hang out on a video call that we have in one of the channels. Uh, paint your models watch stuff, have good live chats. Uh, kind of going to be taking a bit of a backseat in the next two weeks just with the holidays, but typically we do them Wednesday 7 to 10 p.m. Eastern, uh, Saturdays 7 a.m. to 10 a.m. Eastern, and then Saturdays 9 p.m. to 1 a.m. Eastern. Uh, those are for the North American, European, and Australian crowds, respectively. 
Yeah. And if you guys want to have impromptu ones uh, outside of these hours, feel free. Like, just post that you're going to jump in the paint channel. If anybody wants to jump in with you, you guys can hang out together. Um, we have them scheduled to kind of bring, have a time for people to come do it. But if you guys want to do them on your own, feel free. Discord is open for that sort of thing. Yep. We are having our first painting contest. We announced this uh, at the end of our last video, but I'm going to keep mentioning it until it opens up. Uh, our first painting contest is the Night Relic Tour, which... Like I said, I got mine. <laughs> uh, we're going to open up some the these submissions on, uh, I guess nobody outside of Canada knows what this is, but Boxing Day, December 26th. And it's going to run from December 26th until January 16th at 11.59 Eastern. Uh, we're going to have people, you're going to have to post your model with a um, timestamp and your Discord username, just in case. Like, I don't want somebody to post somebody else's model and then, because there's a real prize involved with this. We have to be a little bit stricter with, with what we're doing here. Um, the first place uh, will be judged by the podcast guys, um, the gang, as I like to call us. And uh, you get the winner will be mailed a box of Vanquishers, Vindictors, Vigilors, or Annihilators. Totally your choice. And I'm looking forward to that. We have really good painters in our Discord. Yep. Uh, battle reports are ongoing. Uh, James is going to be coming over during the break. We're going to be taking a look at lighting and, and setting up things of that nature. And we are hoping to start filming in January and then editing in January. <laughs> the editing is going to take a lot longer, I think, than, than filming it will. Uh, so if you want to help us out with that process, consider supporting us on patreon.com slash thestormkeep. Um, you can get early access to episodes. You can vote on upcoming episodes. Right now we have a poll up for uh, which faction you want us to focus on for how to counter everything. I think Iron Jaws are winning right now. The last time I looked, they had the most votes. Uh, so if you want to vote on that poll, yeah, feel free. Uh, tournament reports are being posted up there. A um, bit of a lull because with the holidays, but in the new year, we're going to be going to more events and we're going to be posting more uh, tournaments reports. And there's always the private one-on-one -on -one list workshop. So if you like talking about your list, if you have a big GT coming up and you want to get specific tailored advice on what you could do, uh, then we can offer you that. So there you go. And if you guys have other suggestions for what you would like to get um, as a subscriber or patron or whatever, feel free to let us know. We are still looking for feedback on that. I'll just read a few more chats here and then we can sign off. Da -da -da -da. On the plus side, I got three hours of painting done. Hey, good job, Meat Mop. <laughs> Is the paint channel open to anyone with a mic? Yeah, Noah, feel free to jump in. If you're just painting stuff, feel free to jump in there. Um, there's Anybody can go in. And Jace, at first I thought I was going to be paint a knight relictor to win vanquishers or vigilors. That would get could people. Be. <laughs> could be. No, we're not. Oh, man, I wish. That would be, that would be great. No, just one person gets a box, um, but everybody gets to play. So that's that's the the real prize is the night relictors we made along the way. <laughs> oh, speaking of night relictors, make sure that you join the cult of relictor and you end up voting for the night relictor in the uh, Games Workshop Best Model 2021 contest. Yeah, vote for the night relictor because we want to throw a wrench in the works and we'll just be funny, really. It would just Either that or vote for the crab, because I've seen a lot of people on yeah. the internet talking about voting for the crab. That way, the 40, some 40k model doesn't win. I'm okay with that, too. So, crab yep. gang or relict or cult. Pick one. All right. Thanks for tuning in, guys. Um, see you in the next one. And Merry Christmas, easy, I guess. <laughs>